Hello! Uh, if you haven't seen the first part of this video series that uh, covered episodes 1 to 3, click here or there, or the first link in the description to go to it. If you've seen that video, welcome back and congratulations! Last time I set the goal that if you want to see me complete this series, then you need to fully fund the Animator Dormitory for 2021, and you did! Congratulations! And also fuck you. But no, seriously, thanks for everyone who participated, it really makes a difference. Actually, if you're curious to see the impact this charity makes, you should check out this video by Asian Boss where they interview an animator who actually lives at the dormitory that this uh, charity funds. She's not paid a lot, but my god, her rent is fucking cheap, like 150 USD like a month, bills included. I pay like 150 USD a week, bills not included. Man, I really need to like talk about housing shortages and zoning laws and privatizing cities already. That's the next topic after I tackle copyright. Anyway, let's return to High Guardian Spice. Sorry I got rid of the pirates clothes by the way, uh, we achieved the pirates the west part so if you excuse me I'm gonna get like extra comfy for the uh, four hours I'm gonna be recording for us so... So uh, yeah, okay. So in my previous video I had like a couple of points. One, the world is uncreative at best and completely confusing at worst. Two, Two, uh, the writing is hit or miss. Sometimes it's clever or funny, other times it's nonsense. Three, uh, the plot is incredibly risk averse, avoiding change or consequence or even really any fleshing out of any ideas past the bare minimum. And four, the characters are okay. Attempts at depth and emotional moments are lackluster, but no one is dislikable. Oh, we can go do the next bummer thing you circled if you want. Sage, if you want me to be excited, pick something that's fun, okay? Uh, don't be cynical, Sage. It's a festival. Sheesh. Sage, uh, I needed to do something. Oh, and that's what you went with. Going into episode four, these trends seem to hold true. In fact, this is the episode where we homogenize all the characters and make a whole ass theme about family acknowledgement that means like three out of four characters all have mummy or uh, daddy issues. Ah, in fact, technically all of them all have parental issues since all their core character traits actually just relate to their parents. Anyway, this episode starts with uh, there being like a glowy crab infestation so they have to go home, which is kind of kooky. But it's also the weekend and they're in the middle of the packing so they were gonna go home anyway. Okay. You see a bit more of the cat that will later become a plot twist villain, uh, although nothing really adds significance to that eventual re reveal. I believe this actually is like the most screen time this cat will get in one go. The whole plot twist seems to be like inspired from the Animangus and the Peter Pettigrew thing from Harry Potter, who's like disguised as Ron's pet rat, but it's like, it, it, this is missing a lot of the build up. Like in Harry Potter it's actually a mystery, or at least a big aha moment, because Petey Pegaru is actually connected to established characters and the, the rat actually has scenes centered around it, like Hermione gets a cat that ends up trying to kill the rat, and it becomes a source of drama that reaches its conclusion when you find out the cat actually knew the rat was the bad guy the whole time. It's a little weird, but you get what I mean. To be fair, I was a little disappointed to find out the cat wasn't someone too, it was just kind of, just kind of a cat. Anyway, uh, Time says she's gonna sleep in the woods despite her mother being in town and Parsley insists she comes to her home instead, to which she agrees. Again, there is no breaking down of her shell or explanation as to why she puts up a front, it's just like they just got friendly, uh, like, off screen. Oh, credit where credit is due, this line is good. Oh, Time, no, don't sleep in the woods. You'll scare off the bats. <laughs> also, this episode starts with a fun bit where the chess pet is fighting them and won't let them put stuff in it, but then they just... They just ask it nicely and that fixes it. P please, please take some risks. Please do something more extreme. I'm begging you. <laughs> this this would have been great time for some like world building. Maybe the wood is like, maybe the wood is like the living wood that originates from Time's forest and Time is like, well, of course your chest is grumpy. You haven't been feeding it soil. It's not getting enough nutrients, which turns into a whole thing of, I have to, I have to throw soil into my suitcase to make sure it still works. That's going to ruin all my clothes. And Time's like, what's wrong with earthy turns? I should put a laugh track in there. Then after they get to and from their destination, you can replace some of the flat dialogue scenes with them talking over Sage washing her clothes. All right, B plot. Uh, let's get this over with. Uh, Parsley's family is sexist or whatever, and they want Parsley to stop experimenting with education and come home and be like a house daughter, but Parsley wants to be a guardian and this depresses her because her family won't acknowledge her. Also, by coincidence, Time's mother shows up at the blacksmith, and she's like, come back home, what the fuck are you doing? And she's like, I didn't want to bother you because I think that you think that I'm useless because you wouldn't let me stay with my father to protect our home from the rot. Meanwhile, the couple housing Rose and Sage get her a Terrasphere, which is new magic, but Sage is uncomfortable with this because her, her family hates new magic and wouldn't... 
wouldn't acknowledge her if she did new magic. <sighs> this feels a lot like She-Ra. Um, spoilers for She-Ra. Like, one character with a parent issue is fine. Catra is great. She always is, like, compared to her superior sibling by her parental figure, and that's given her issues where she never feels praised enough or good enough. But then you find out that she has the same issues with her parental figure, and they can kind of relate. And it's like, okay, I mean, it's still, it's still depth, I guess. <sighs> and then you... <laughs> It's like you find out that there's a bigger, badder, better version of the big bad Hordak, literally called Hordak Prime, and the big bad guy is trying to prove himself to the bigger bad guy. It's like your personal experience is showing right another fucking character. Although I do sympathize with this to some extent, to be fair. So for those who don't know, as part of my whole pro piracy copyright spiel, I started writing my own story and webcomic and put it in the public domain. And an interesting problem arose that you really don't think about when you're being a critic or even when you're writing fix it fan fiction. See, it's one thing to look at a story that already exists and pinpoint why it is or isn't engaging, or even to write your own fan fiction uh, using someone else's characters, world building sets and scenes and morph that into something engaging. But it's another thing entirely to have to come up with that stuff in the first place so that you can play with it. Like, say you're like Shira and you want to create a deep character with a redemption arc like Zuko. If you successfully create that, it'll be engaging, which is your goal in storytelling. But you can't just write deep character with redemption arc on a piece of paper and call it a day. Zuko has all these moments that, and things that are like specific to him that are used to evoke that feeling of deep character redemption story. Zuko's engagement comes from his opinions. It's his belief in destiny and what that means and how that shifts over the course of the narrative. But to make this character, you need to think of Zuko's understanding of honor and dis destiny in the first place. And then you need to create scenes and specific things that happen in the show that show this. And it's like, how do you think of that? It's, it's easy to do it in reverse as a critic, but how do you create it from scratch? How do you just like birth that from your mind out of nothing? If you look at interviews with creators of popular stories and how they came up with the original idea, no one ever says it was like their day one. Your mind doesn't spawn ideas from nothing. Your brain is more like this forever moving segue where it jumps from idea to idea via what connects them. Sometimes it also reacting to stimulus, but ultimately in order to create new ideas, you have to augment what you're already thinking about with another idea, like making it more extreme or being more realistic or sadder or happier, or just otherwise trying to find some connection with some other idea so that you can change it into something else that's within the scope of your brain's ability to move to something else. This is why you have shows like Shira and High Guardian Spice that have this issue writing unique characters because they go to write a backstory and have no idea where to start except personal experience because that's where every writer's brain automatically goes to at first. The answer to this I found was to create something I call tangibles. That is, anything that exists in your story that's not inherently designed to be engaging. This can literally be anything, any object, any concept, it can be something that exists in real life, or it can be something you create yourself. It is something that it can exist as standalone in your story, even if it's not engaging. I.e. it's already tangible within your story, unlike the engagement that you intend to make tangible within your story. The idea is to make these in order for you to actually allow your brain to make the jump to the fully formed scene with the engagement. I'll give you an example from my own work. So in Airblock Bound, I have a character who has been alone as a slave for years, and for the plot to continue, I need to draw the other character's attention to him so they can interact and continue the story. So to do this, I want to create something extreme to alert the other characters, and since I need to do something extreme, I decided this is a good fit for a spectacle-heavy scene to make it entertaining as well as move the plot along. With this, I know what I want the scene to be, and I know how I want to engage my audience, but of course, I don't have a way to create the scene, to actually make it tangible. So I look at all the tangibles I already have at my disposal, and extend the logic out to create some new ones. So the MC was in charge of maintaining and growing a garden, so I was like, alright, let's expand this out, and so I wrote down all the things that might logically be in a garden. Gazebos, divining walls, bird baths, then I started looking at flowers and plants. I did a Google search and found a bunch of different types, and started just like writing them all down until one caught my eye. Dandelions. I said, they're a really interesting plan. Let's try applying the engagement. What happens if I try to make dandelions more extreme? And my mind immediately found a line of logic that connected those two things. What if you have a giant field of dandelions and blow them all away at once? And from there, the scene itself was like very easy to write. There was a bit of logic I needed to correct the dots with, but to write everything in the scene, I just had to take every other tangible in the story and then decide using basic logic, what would happen if you just chucked a shit ton of dandelion seeds at them? As a result, it created a scene that uh, one of the comments described as one hell of an inciting incident. 
Please support me on Studio High C so I can pay the artists to make more pages and get to that scene as fast as possible. I'm very fond of it and I want to see it come to life. Going back to Guardian Hi Guardian High C. <laughs> Going back to High Guardian Spice, in order to not retread the ground when creating the depth for these characters, they really need to dig into and expand their tangibles. So Parsley is a dwarf, so expand out dwarfs. What are they known for? What's their culture like? Write down things like their blacksmiths. Maybe write down tools, weapons, locations, materials. Maybe her death should center around some kind of enchanted tool. Maybe those dwarfs are super protective over their methods, and so their family was banished for wanting to share their skills. Or maybe their family were living in poverty until they stole their skills from the upper class and were banished once they were found out. This instills Parsley with a belief that knowledge is made to be shared generously, but also giving her unresolved issues and resentment to her own kind for being so selfish. Tangibles. This is actually why I like Sage's arc better, because as stupid as the old magic, new magic thing is, you can see they've utilized new stimuli to create her character, and so her depth, while still being parental, is actually a lot better because of it. Her usage of heavy quotes, old magic, is a significant established part of her character and the world. If you took away Sage's parental issues, it would change her character and what she's done in the show significantly because she wouldn't care about old magic. But if you took away Parsley's parental issues, it wouldn't change anything, she'd be the exact same. This whole thing was only hinted at once with one ominous turn away and look to the ground. Like, character development and depth works at its best when it results in actions. This is why just simply adding a sad backstory doesn't necessarily amount to depth. The backstory needs to give context to who they are, not just be sad. Anyway, point is, this is alright, although it does feel a little lackluster. But that's okay, because we're about to go to see a Terrasphere store and find out more about them, right? Here. Uh, have a look. Uh, let me know. I'll, I'll swap them out. Uh, you know, you can just like go ahead and knock on my skull if if you need assistance. Wait, what is a terror spear? Talk to me. Our house had the whole palisman thing where a staff combines with an animal, and Harry Potter had the whole Ollivander explain how a wand is a mind of its own. This was your chance, your moment, but you just fucking leave. It's just like have a ball, and now it's a staff. Fuck. Um. Okay. Don't break our staff. You know, I actually thought Slime Boy had such slurred speech intentionally because he was like very shy and like soft-spoken character, but I think it was really just. I think it was just bad. Okay. Why was this line we'll like that? This scene literally boils down to her picking a random one, and then, and then goes like, "I like it," and then they, then they move on. <laughs> it's not just the creativity. This is almost exactly like the Harry Potter one choosing until you realize there's no extra significance to the one she chose either. In Harry Potter, it's the same type of wand as the Big Bad, with them even sharing a feather core from the exact same phoenix. To be fair, creativity aside, uh, you then find out that she was just being polite about getting a Terrasphere, and she didn't actually really want one because her mum disapproves, but then she found a connection with the one she picked up in the store and she's conflicted. At this point, these two show her pictures of her mum practicing new magic in a phase she had. I think this is fine, honestly, it's not a jaw-dropping twist, but it's a little swerve. I was a little concerned at this point I was starting to see a pattern though. Rose broke her weapon, but her mom did it, so it's fine. Sage doesn't want to go to, uh, against her parents and do new magic, but her mom did it, so it's fine. Uh, but it doesn't seem like this is repeated anywhere after. But like, both of these things could have been something a character wrestled with emotionally and led to into like character development or a new way of thinking uh, that pushed the character into a new direction, but the conclusion ends up being, ah, don't worry about it, man, just keep doing what you're doing. Again, I don't think this is bad, but maybe it could have been extended into like more of an arc or just improved somewhat, but it's all right. But at least this results in a tangible change, albeit not a philosophical change for Sage. Those those little changes really matter in keeping things fresh in a series like this. Uh, it's a pity it's been four episodes without a proper explanation of the difference between magic types, but uh, but hey, next episode we finally get that explanation, and we fucking break everything. Episode five. All right, let's get the compliments out of the way first. There are two genuinely good bits of creativity here. They have translucent piranha plants that look like light bulbs and you can watch things disintegrate inside them. That's cool. Now do something with it. You will never see these again. What does get used again is the staffs, which one of the professors uses as hair sticks by resizing them. That's really creative. I made a video about uh, Arcane where I talk about reuse being the heart of world building. To, so to summarize, the more you reuse things for different reasons while maintaining the same rules, the more connected each scene feels to each other rather than like a standalone thing. This is how 2D linear forms of media like video can feel like something bigger, like a world. In this case here, it's about reusing the staffs for something different, hair sticks. 
so it's cool. So this episode is all about new magic and old magic. Basically the world and characters push Sage, who isn't using her Terra Sphere yet, to reconsider her magic choice and she goes away to cry and ends up learning new magic and masters a bit of it as the other characters find her to support her slash apologize in Time's case. This is the infamous episode where the definitions between new and old magic start to contradict. The goal is to harvest these plants with new magic, but Sage wants to do it with old magic because it's what she knows, but it's taking her too long and the teacher grills her on it. There's a little more nuance than I made out in the last video, to be fair. There's an implication that new magic actually causes the rot, because Sage says her mother plants a tree after a significant spell, and then we switch to time drawing the rot. I don't know why she's drawing the rot in a sketchbook. It's it's hardly a high school crush, although maybe it's a character trait. She does this elsewhere, actually, uh, although I think it's it's just so the writer can tell you what she's thinking because she's a very quiet character. So this is like, this is nice in principle, but it tells us nothing about the difference in like actuality. We never see anyone doing old magic even plant a tree, so this kind of comes off as some random theory by a random person rather than an actual tangible reason anyone in this world would use old magic. Which honestly I'd be fine with if it was just superior except for a hidden drawback nobody realizes yet, but then the show will contradict this later by having some teachers combine the two without establishing anything about it that would suggest doing so. Or near the end how they have Amaryllis lead a whole bunch of students and they split up the old and new magic people, like it's something like half the students specialize in despite clearly saying there's no reason to. Then there's Time who quote, doesn't mess with that shit in reference to new magic and has actually used old magic in scenes before, but then in this scene she never explains why and doesn't participate in this exercise, instead encourages Amaryllis to do the job for her with new magic. What's her opinion on using the shit magic? Why does she use the shit magic? In fact, why does she literally agree with Amaryllis when she insults old magic? Blah, 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 blah. Old magic is sacred. What's the sacred part, Slab? Sweating into plants instead of going to lunch? Yeah. What? And none of this beats the holy grail of what the fuck world building. Is it okay if I use old magic? Why crawl through the desert delirious with thirst when you can summon an oasis of sparkling water in any flavor you choose? It's impractical. New magic doesn't require the hours of ritual, the reckoning, the effort. It's just new magic is better. New magic multiplies your power and lets you do what you want. With new magic, you can do anything. <laughs> You are telling me old magic is useless because you could do anything with new magic in a class where you were collecting ingredients. Ingredients for what? Can't you do fucking anything? She literally just said this episode that they were using ingredients collected from the fly traps for spells. We will use the collected buds in future spells. I thought that was old magic. Ah! As far as I'm aware, the only things that are exclusive to new magic and aren't contradicted is the Terra Sphere. You can't even say drawing runes is exclusive to old magic because one of the teachers is drawing runes in class. <laughs> and we're not even fucking done. The further we go, the more we're going to add more new ideas and concepts to this that are maybe sorta kinda differences, but all of it is just gonna be vague and dance around anything that explains what we've seen, like it knows what it wants to be but fails to provide anything tangible or anything that it has to actually stick to. Anyway, all this talk of how useless old magic is makes Sage cry, and she runs off. Amaryllis gets some good lines in here, uh, cause she thinks time is trying to make her cry. That's something. I love you. You are the shining beacon of good writing in the show. All of this leads to Sage practicing in secret, and at the very least we get a bit of a demonstration on new magic. Basically it's very flexible and free, and there's a challenge in properly visualizing what you want to do. This, if anything, implies that there's a bit of a learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, it's superior in every way. But of, of course we're going to contradict this later. New magic. The only decent way to do anything. New magic users, draw your Terra Spheres. Old magics, you have a sigil spell for a protective shield, right? Good. All of you keep the smoke and fire at bay. But they have a bit of fun with this, with accidentally multiplying grogs. Again, it would be good if they went a bit further and had more fun. The magic going fucking wild and spawning like a million go gro grogs, goats, grog. It's like a goat frog. I. I um, but like spawning a million grogs is like funny and is more what we're looking for, but like have them take over the fucking school. Show us them getting into people's business. Have one guy surf to class on a hallway of grogs. How about 
they become translucent and go into the walls to hide so no one like can get them. So even when you think Sage has fixed it, you just have occasional grogs randomly appearing out of walls in following episodes. Anyway, she fixes it after the group catches up, and Time apologizes for making her cry, uh, and says that she can do it, and then she does in fact do it. By the way, yes was all Time said. She even comments that she didn't say anything mean, but Parsi's like, that is an apology. Like, she knows she's in the right, even though she wasn't even there. Then Time r reluctantly apologizes. I don't know, this sort of petty moment followed by an apology rings really hollow for me, but we'll sort of talk about melodrama a bit later. Alright, episode 6. This episode is about doing an obstacle course. I'm starting to sound like a broken record at this point, but normally in a fantasy world, I'd write some interesting obstacles first and then play off it, but this seems to want to do a boring love triangle and then have some generic obstacles that bring out that in the character, like block puzzles. You did not just use your magic system to move a fucking block in a block puzzle. Good, great, no, no, I'm glad magic still exists in the world. Yeah, thanks for reminding me and doing literally nothing else. But at this point, it's clear that this isn't really what they're going for, so I'm not gonna really mention creativity much outside of like, maybe giving some examples of how to insert it. What the point of this episode actually is, is a love triangle. Yay. Maybe this would be alright as like a romance episode, but the romance elements are fucking boring. On one side, Rosemary falls for a pretty boy that's a total douchebag and obviously isn't going to stick around past this episode since he was literally just introduced just for this. So there's no real tension or drama and Sage isn't even in love with Rosemary, she's just jealous like, like the bros before ho shit. The only one that's actually crushing is Snapdragon falling for Sage and getting jealous that she wants to talk about Rosemary, about how disgruntled she is in her. This love plot is boring, irrelevant to anything and everything, and the characters become like 10 times more annoying for a single episode. I guess I should talk about love plots for a bit. So I wouldn't really call romance its own engagement, it's more like, same thing as a character death, which we talked about last time, it's a generic event in a story that ha is like a condensed bomb of different engagements. A romance plotline has a good deal of change, that is to say, character development and relationship development. It comes with a lot of characterization as each stage of the development comes with its own little moments, the starting seed, how they realize their feelings, how they cope and manage those feelings, how they reveal or try to reveal those feelings, and then finally them getting together. And it also comes with a good deal of empathy, the opportunity to have your characters feel strong emotions and have them be reflected in the audience. But the big part in making this work is the logic. Your audience has to understand why the characters fall for each other and what's going through their heads leading them to the choices they make. The more these core reasons are to their character, usually the better it comes across. This is what separates things like Korra and Marco in the love triangle shit and Korra and something like Beauty and the Beast that has very specific points where you can see the relationship move from enemies to lovers. We'll talk about this a bit later, but this is usually the reason the love at first sight trope feels quite superficial, especially here where Rosemary just sees him enter the class and instantly fucking falls for him. I mean, Rosemary is more of a tomboy, so this doesn't even feel like a natural extension of a character to be like boy crazy. This whole episode is basically her falling head over heels until it's clear he's a douchebag and nowhere near as cool and attractive as she first thought. Clear to Rosemary at least, the plot makes it, you know, like really obvious that he's like an idiot from step one. But for example, wouldn't this have been like so much better if this guy like actually seemed like a genius and Rose fell for him not because he's attractive and cool, but because she thinks he's everything she aspires to be as a warrior and guardian and idolizes him, as well as the fact he's hot. Of course this isn't true, he's a total fraud and that's why Rose ends up hating him, but until she realizes he can brag about a bunch of adventures and experiences he's had before he even came to school. He can pretend he has guardians in the family just like Rose, and he has a bunch of connections he can make up like like bullshit advice to make it seem like he knows what he's talking about, like shh, t trade secret, all guardians try to keep loose and flexible in a fight. But the, the best actually clench their butt, and like just their butt. Believe me, I know my uncle is like ex-guardian. But maybe by the end of it, a much more quiet new character wins the obstacle course and landslide in a very subtle way. He turns out to be everything Asta pretended to be without the bravado, and it shows Rose that she's really bad at picking out actually good guardians. This can be a development for Rose, and she realizes how much she's got to learn since she's since such an obvious fraud managed to trick her. In fact, she cries about it, and the others are confused since she just met him today, so it's weird for her to be heartbroken about it. But she confesses she's actually crying because she really doesn't know what it means to be a guardian, and that breaks her heart more than losing a crush ever could. 
Anyway, this whole thing about keeping the reasons for falling in love core to the character is actually kind of the reason I like the whole weapon swapping thing at the start of this episode. Many of the side characters practice with their weapons, but the teacher sees that neither Amaryllis nor Snapdragon are really gelling with their weapons, so he swaps them. This is cool because it ties into core elements of their backstory and character, which makes perfect sense too. Snapdragons is from a family of machos, so of course he had a battle axe, and Amaryllis is from witch country, the hoity-toity capital, so of course she had a more elegant weapon. But personality-wise, Snapdragon is more of an elegant person, and Amaryllis has a wild streak. I can't say the same for Snapdragon, but for Amaryllis, this axe really like builds on her character and helps give her more characterization. Unlike the love triangle, it's not just a plot beat for the sake of a plot beat, it's an element of characterization that stuck because it gave her a positive new facet to a character that neatly ties on to everything already established. We could just chop our way through the maze, you know? for trapping me, you bastard! <laughs> what does the axe give Emeril's? A way to establish character traits that link in to what she's already demonstrated. What does Rosemary going inexplicably boy crazy do? Nothing. We've established she's brash, adventurous, and misses her mom. This doesn't mean you can't establish new character traits, but this is at worst a trait that makes her less likable, and at best a trait that makes her less con uh, character less consistent, but at the very least won't be around for very long. Like at least when Mabel from Gravity Falls is boy crazy, you can at least feel like this is part of what makes her Mabel, although it is used very well for jokes as well. When it happens here, you're just like, I know this is changing next episode, why even waste my time with this new character you've reskinned to look like Rose? This is also the part where we start teasing the gender questioning arc for Snapdragon. But uh, before someone jumps down my throat, by the end of the season, this character hasn't really made any decision on transitioning. It goes as far as nail painting and the option of transition magic being floated, as well as the idea that there are more options than you realize. There is no official demands for changing of pronouns or anything like that, which is why I'm still calling him a guy. I've also got conflicting tweets from show creator and actor. The, the creator tweet was from before the show aired, but even the actor's tweet, even if the actor's tweet is right, presumably a trans character would still go by he before they decide to transition. It just seems kind of weirdly retroactive to give them pronouns for what they will be in future, even if it doesn't make sense in context. So in this scene, Sage won't shut up about how she feels betrayed as a friend that Rosemary is obsessed with a boy. This is quite clunky and leads her into banging on about the friendship between girls or whatever, and Snapdragon is a guy, so he wouldn't get it. This pisses off Snapdragon because he's quite insecure about his gender, even if he doesn't quite understand why. Uh, I like this from uh, Snapdragon's side. This is the characterization thing I talked about before with Wandering Musgo. Uh, finding an interesting way to demonstrate a feeling that was the end of a sentence. <coughs> However, from Sage's side, this dialogue is clunky as shit, and the writers are bending over backwards to get the dialogue to where it needs to be for Snapdragon's reaction. So, let's talk dialogue. Stop talking about Aster and Rosemary. She likes him. Who cares? I care. What if Amaryllis was going on and on about Aster all day? I'd be happy for her. She usually just talks about murder. Rose and I are girls. You and Amaryllis are a different story. Guys just don't understand that the bond between girls is just deeper and- Dialogue is kind of like a microcosm of storytelling as a whole. It's about balancing logic with engagements. Your engagements can't be understood unless they make logical sense, but a story with only logic has no entertainment value. So you have to manipulate everything you control to form engagements, but you must keep things logical to maximize those engagements. Dialogue doesn't just exist to be realistic, there's always a goal, usually a moment or a line you want to reach, or some form of characterization. It's, it's pretty slight, but if the characters stop acting in a way that you can understand to set themselves up for it, it detracts from the moment. It's like a very small scale example of when a writer needs characters to meet up accidentally but doesn't give them any some kind of like common goal or something that would help them reach the same location and just like half ass it. Like, I don't know, I really feel like going for a walk in this dark alley at 3am. Like, you can tell Sage has this weird out-of-the-box opinion about guy friendship just to rub it in Snapdragon's face that he's a guy, so you can get, like, this reaction. understand that the bond between girls is just deeper. And that I'm a girl. You couldn't possibly understand. Girls and guys and guys and girls and girls and... <sighs> I'm sick of you talking like that and characterize Snap as gender questioning. And the explanation for why she brings it up doesn't really do anything to alleviate it. 
Like, what does guys not talking about their feelings have anything to do with you obsessing over your best friend not hanging out with you for a day? If you gave a better explanation like, you wouldn't get it. Guys don't even notice when their friends leave for a week. You wouldn't even think it's a big deal, but it is for girls. It would alleviate some of it, but even then, the actual line that Snap gets to... <laughs> but even then, the actual line that gets Snap to... Snap has to be confrontational, otherwise it's out of- it's an outburst of anger that's gonna feel illogical. You have to give him a justification for his character to get angry over this, like you've already established it's a weak spot. Actually, even if you don't, as long as you have Sage be surprised at the sudden anger, it'll work as an audience surrogate to subtly tell the audience that this isn't normal and something deeper is going on. You can also make Snapdragon just angry in general, but this requires changing his core character trait. But that's another way you can alleviate the issue. By changing the core character traits, you can make what by default is a weird thing to say and instead make it feel like it's a natural extent to the character. Like, if Sage was a ditzy, fucking, horoscope-loving, superstitious girl, I'd absolutely buy this about guy friendships and girl friendships. But she's not. She's a socially anxious, introverted bookworm. So her being like, ugh, you wouldn't get it. It feels very confrontational of her. Like, I'm reminded of uh, Sokka from Avatar, who- oh hey, more sex with politics, what a good analogy. But this was established in episode 1 and gets concluded in episode 3. So by episode 3, when Sokka acts like this, it doesn't feel weird for a normal person to do this, because he's not a normal person. He's Sokka, and he's sexist. But in High Guardian Spice, this was never an established trait of Sage. But the way that Snapdragon's gender queerness expresses itself by him getting angry because he's just slash insecure is more of that thing Wandering Musuko did that I described in the last ex last episode, and it feels pretty natural to this character, especially with the emphasis we put on the way that Sage reacts in a way that suggests that the story n knows that, like this isn't a normal reaction. Although, the a lot right now. I'm sick of you talking like that. I'm sick of a lot right now feels very weird to me. No one would hint like this about something they feel insecure about. The writer, the writer is like clearly trying to be like, ooh, there are details, mystery. But like, it's like a soft side of the character, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't, like, unless you're trying to get them to know, you wouldn't do this. We'll talk about the rest of this arc and the Caraway rewrite. I was gonna do uh, last video in a few episodes, but uh, like, all right, what else is in this episode? Oh yeah. Uh, we learn more about Amaryllis this episode, and she's still by far the best character. What do your parents do? Travel, mostly. I was raised by nine au pairs. I wish I- Don't. Don't say you would trade all your money to have parents that would spend more time with you. No, no, don't start talking about your parents, you're gonna ruin it. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'd rather eat rocks than listen to my mother go on about her affairs. <laughs> We've got that in common. Wait, do you mean affairs like the- business stuff? Oh, <laughs> she's a lush who never met a deckhand she didn't deck with her hands. <laughs> she's a human shipwreck. Oh, never mind. Okay, she's still the best character. So besides the A, B, and C plot, there's also a D plot with Parsley and Parnell. He's a side character who helps Sage with her magic last episode. And there's some scenes we could talk about here, like when they have to cross a chasm and Parnell just fucking chucks himself in. <laughs> How did you know you'd bounce? I didn't. But in general, I don't believe in oblivion. Want some trail mix? So maybe I'm wrong in this, because I've seen clips on YouTube where people seem to kind of like this, but to me I'd class this as like a weak example of what the fuck humor. Unlike normal humor, where there's usually a line of logic, what the fuck humor skips the line of logic and relies on creating a as strong an irony as possible and exaggerating it as much as possible to compensate for the lack of logic. So in this instance here, it's not really a visceral or visual irony, it's pure dialogue with the contrast being certain death against, nah, I don't believe in dying. Usually what the fuck humor such as this relies very much on using visuals to create extremes that you don't understand but have such baffling contrast that it becomes funny. I guess since this is an obstacle course, I could talk a bit about, uh, like spectacle and visuals, although this is something I pretty recently started building theories for, so it'll be a little vague. But with all the characters moving around a lot and doing feats of athleticism, this would have been a good cr uh, chance to like create some cool visuals. I tried to employ this a bit when I was doing the prologue chapter for Airlock Bound, where the main character fights a bunch of wolves. I knew it wasn't enough to say he swings his sword a bunch of times, so I ended up using tangibles I had in the environment to create two concepts. Um, I've been calling them particles and flow. 
that is, finding ways to add small things to the visuals so it's not just the characters, and giving direction and emphasizing motion to a visual respectively. So the fight was in a wheat field and the MC's head was made of fire. When the walls turn to run, the MC tries to cut them off by jumping over them and landing in front. Now that by itself is a thing, it has some level of spectacle, at least it's not standing still, you know. You know, it's more extreme than that. But then I realized, because his head was fire, I can have this trail out behind him and create a sense of flow, and also brilliantly contrast like the night sky. Furthermore, wheat is flammable, so before I had him jump, I had him miss a sword swipe and cut the wheat instead, sending it up into the air, creating these particles that lit up in the night sky from the fire on his head when he moved to jump through them. High County Spice doesn't do any of this. Uh, you could maybe repurpose this fog and use it similarly, have it trail behind, use a, a blast of strong magic to clear it all at once in a dramatic moment. You could even use uh, silhouettes or have characters make an entrance out of it. Good visuals is really, I think, about finding unique ways to utilize your tangibles. It's kind of like characterization, but not with any characters. I'm trying to learn to use my compass. It points north. That's that's literally its only function. Returning to the Rosemary plot, the basic gist is that she discovers he's a dick and stops being lovey-dovey. So while this plot starts off as a weird drama love triangle thing, by the end of it, it seems to be more going for a hateable character to create a satisfying, you get what you deserve kind of thing at the end. The problem is that it, it, it doesn't commit hard enough. <laughs> the worst thing this guy does is say things that are rude. Like, zero actions, he doesn't fuck anyone's girlfriend, technically he doesn't even insult anyone, at least in intentions. Like, he says things that are absolutely sexist, yes. He makes a bunch of assumptions about Rosemary's capabilities and desires that are not correct because of her gender, but the impression I get is that he's not trying to hurt her, he's definitely trying to seduce her, which is why he lies about all his achievements and does a bunch of romantic things. Like, he's not the type to say, get back at the kitchen like you don't know your place, he's more the type to, to like lovingly buy you a set of pot and pans without you once ever talking about cooking. The only direct insult you get is when Rosemary flat out rejects him and he says that she's stuck up. That's it. So when you get the satisfying revenge moment, it's less of a satisfying revenge moment and more of a, you dropped a hammer on someone's toe for being rude? What? I actually fucking hate this scene. Maybe I'm getting slightly political, uh, but I find it fucking eerie how left-leaning media has this tendency to present violence as a justified reaction to words. Even by the teacher! He fucking laughs at this! Whoops! Dropped my hammer! I should be more careful! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that was very irresponsible of you, Parsley. It just, it just feels like no one has to hold themselves to A standards. Violence is never okay, unless you think they deserve it, at which point you become the sole arbiter of good and evil. And not only that, I feel like this ruins Parsley's character too. Her core character trait up until now was that she was the nice one, but suddenly physical pain is fine. It's weird, at the very least have another character do it like Time, who's a bit more grey, or even just Rose. Of course, I suppose the real reason they chose Parsley is her weapon wouldn't have to logically show any blood, which is very important. If they use the hammer, then you don't have to notice that potentially breaking half the bones in someone's foot as a reaction to them saying that someone is stuck up is reprehensibly evil. I'm not even saying your characters have to have a hard line of violence against words, although perhaps all your characters, including your nicest ones, shouldn't all have the exact same opinion on this, because it makes it seem like the writers are speaking, not the characters. At the very least, you have to earn these moments. Like, technically, Edward Elric starts beating the shit out of a character just for saying something too. Like, this isn't self-defense. But what gives this context is that he fused his dog and his fucking daughter together. Beating the shit out of him as opposed to just turning him into the police isn't presented as the right thing to do. It is, however, very satisfying to watch because you hate this character. In order for this to at least be satisfying, you have to go further. I made a video on how to rewrite Voldemort to be more hateable if you want to see it, but to shorthand, make it personal, go for insecurities, and establish the character as knowing their, like, how hurtful they're being. Because despite being a dick, the guy is obviously not aware of it because he's clearly trying to fuck her. If this guy was a player and it's obvious he just gets off on leading girls on, or if he's a cheat, or if he gets off to emotionally manipulating girls that would do anything he asks in fear of being dumped, all of this would make this perhaps not justifiable but satisfying. In fact, I'd probably avoid the violence for something like this and instead go for some kind of verbal or emotional revenge. Embarrass him, force him to lose his cool persona, have everyone laugh at him, because that would be his insecurity and would make for a lot more of a satisfying revenge than 
Ha ha, parsley drop hammer, you go hospital now. Ugh. Okay, next episode. Episode 7. In episode 7, the characters are tested with a mission outside Lingarth. It starts with them leaving town to, like, cheers of people. Their cheers indicate that it might be dangerous, and the cast can't work out if it's tradition to scare them or if it's actually dangerous. But then, at the cave, the teacher says that, with a straight face, that some of them will die. Very proud of this class, and I fully expect a good number of you to live. And then, a bit after... Another teacher pretends to make a scary noise coming for the cave. Sorry, kids. He does that every year. Is it is it is it dangerous? Is it dangerous or not? But then he says the part that exceeds your training is beyond the level they need to go to get the the vial of magical spring water they need. But then, why does she expect some will die? And she does it with like a straight. I, I'm really confused. Also, in order to remind you of time's plotline and motivation, we get the most <laughs> we get the most awkward line of dialogue. Um, Professor Hakone, I have a question. Hmm, go ahead. Can the spring, the, um, the healing waters, what do they heal? Could they heal a tree? Yes. Yes, I suppose it could. You are ready. It's like the plot is trying to remind you of time's motivation without telling you too much so as not to take away from the mystery of it since it's still up in the air. Because it's like... Heal the tree from what? Why wouldn't you specify what? Like, I'm sure it'll heal a cut in the tree, but what if you nuclear bomb the tree or put termites in it? Isn't it important to specify how it's damaged in order to know how to heal it? Anyway, the teacher says, yes, it, it could heal a tree without asking anything further because he knows he needs to motivate time for the plot without actually giving away a mystery. <laughs> this is so awkward. <laughs> Anyway, they find a spring, but it's dried up, and then we encounter the helpful glowy crabs we've seen- Oh Jesus, what the fuck? There's some alright action, but Rose gets injured, and then she hides it. This would be a good moment to characterize a core character trait. Like, last time I talked about establishing a trait that a warrior never shows weakness, and this would have been a great logical extension of that. But here it's like- it's just like the boy crazy thing. Characters gain whatever traits they're needed to fit the plot. When a new character trait is introduced, it doesn't feel like a logical extension of a character, nor is it any attempt made to explain why she's like that. So I'm like, why does she hide it? And so it doesn't really like characterize her or add any depth. Then they meet a weird elf thing who will help them for a riddle. Fairly generic fantasy stuff. I kind of like some of the lines you get from out of this guy. We have no time for that. Is there something we can trade you for the location? A true love's kiss? No, no kissing, Buckles. Oh, markedly, you loathe my rhyme, but you got woes and I've got time. Um, but the riddle is that they have to work out that there's more than one of him, which I'm pretty sure I've seen this kind of thing before, but it's fine. Uh, but as reward for the riddle, they help them out on their directions and randomly throw them their treasure, which is a dragon's egg, which is set up for a sort of puzzle solve they've designed to be clever, but just kind of feels like it's set up for this purpose specifically and takes away for the intelligence. We'll get to it. So they get further down, find the water, get attacked by an indestructible statue made of diamond, and defeat them by making them hit each other. This is fine, but it's also like a standard fantasy trope puzzle thing. Hell, this exists, this puzzle exists in like, Paper Mario. Now the unique puzzle is actually how they escape after they smash the statues in front of the door, blocking it off. Maybe if we- Call it a day, Parse. The chamber is sealed. This room exists to protect the fountain, even if it means trapping it and us forever. Uh, I don't think it was designed for that. If you made them smash each other not in front of the door, you wouldn't have this problem. But now the puzzle is, how do they escape? And they realize if they throw the dragon's egg into a big pool of healing water that they were looking for, it'll accelerate its life and hatch it into a full-blown dragon. I could go for a cheap shot and poke holes in your healing water healing by accelerating life. Like, shouldn't using this on Rose just make her die quicker? But fuck it, it's not about direct contradiction, and the writer can't be reading out a whole wiki article every time the audience encounter a plot device. Even if we know deep down that, that wiki article could never exist. Instead, let's talk about why this doesn't feel very clever. To create the solution, you need the healing water and the dragon egg. The healing water is fine, but the dragon egg feels convenient. See, the healing water doesn't just exist for this puzzle. It didn't just happen to be in the room they got stuck in, it was their goal. But the dragon egg, not so much. Don't get me wrong, if this was real life and real people actually got stuck in this situation and used a dragon egg they happened to come by, it would actually feel clever. But since this is a story with a creator who has clearly intentionally added this for this purpose, it doesn't feel smart. 
This is why the healing water is fine. It makes the writing feel clever because you know that they're not making just whatever they need, they're utilizing what they already have. The healing water has fulfilled multiple purposes so far. It's important to time to heal the rot, it's been used to heal Rose, and it's their goal to complete the test. But the dragon egg was given to them by a totally new group of characters and they didn't even ask for it. They just gave them a treasure for completing the riddle. What you really need is for the dragon egg to fulfill a separate purpose in the story so by the time you get here the author is making use of something that already exists, not creating something to solve an arbitrary problem. For this we can actually look to the scene which I'm pretty sure inspired this in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Uh, they do basically a bank heist to get a special item from a vault. This vault is so highly valued that it actually has extra security measures, notably a dragon. In fact, getting past the dragon to get to the vault is its own puzzle with its own solution, so by the time it's needed for the plot it feels like a genuine part of the world. So when they go to escape they get cornered between the dragon and the guards and decide the best way to escape is to mount the dragon, free it from its chains and let it rip through the enemy. I could say this dragon was also foreshadowed as early as the first book, but ultimately what's important is that it has a reason to be there so it doesn't feel like it was intentionally placed there by the author. Or at least if it was, it's been planned out so far in advance that you can still admire the Raya's chops for doing so. Alright, wind back. So before they actually work out the puzzle, they're actually stuck in here for a while and they think they're gonna starve. This is actually a pretty solid scene. Might be one of my favourites actually. You know how I was talking about how Time's development with her shell breaking down should be on the screen? This actually does some of it. Kind of the wrong order, but that's okay. They play truth or dare. Time doesn't want to tell stuff about herself so she chooses dare. But Sage dares her to give Rosemary a compliment and she begrudgingly admits that she's loyal to her friends. It's fun to see the side of her when she's forced to be nice, and with them being trapped in a cave, it's the perfect time for it to come out. The only thing that isn't here is a reason, quarter or character about why she has a shell in the first place, but I've given up on that at this point. They actually get quite a lot of characterization mileage out of this truth or dare, with them all having interesting questions or challenges, Rose sort of finally admits her insecurity about her mom disappearing and how that makes her feel, and Time asks Parsley which is her favourite brother, which is a fun question that ultimately leads to... Wow, okay, uh, who's your least favourite brother? Hmm, I used to hate Thistle, but then Spurge almost drowned and Thistle saved him and I knew I don't hate anyone. Ever. Wow, this would have been great characterization for you if you didn't drop a fucking hammer on a boy's foot just for being rude last episode! We also get time relating to Rose because she's been away from her parents too, her dad. This is good, I always enjoy when characters find common ground with each other. And that's when we get backstory. Time and her mother had to flee their home because of the rot, but her dad stayed behind to help. Time wanted to stay but she was forced to leave too. Making her feel worthless in her father's eyes and resentful against her mother for dragging her to Lingarth. This is why she wanted the water to heal the rot. Again, nice to get this development on screen, although it's eh, fairly generic stuff. And I wish we could have had more depth on why time was closed off, instead of just being presumably how she is. But it's good for what it is! Anyway, all downhill from here. So similar to the Harry Potter thing, they bust through the ground on the back of the dragon. Uh, then its skin falls off and it falls to the ground as bones, but then the bones go, I'm okay. This is actually a really fun as far as like what the fuck humor goes. Just the contrast of you thinking it's dead only for the literal skeleton to say, I'm fine. It's funny even if you don't get the reason because the contrast is strong enough. Not that I think there's a reason, <laughs> I think they just, just wanted to do this. Then it flies into the air, explodes into fireworks, and the fireworks become stars. Do you see why this is a weaker on like the, the what the fuck scale? I could get exploding after saying I'm fine, there's a, there's a contrast there. What was up with the stars? Why are they all chill with it? I'm actually so confused, I legit can't even make a guess as to what they were going for here. Anyway, they use the healing water to heal the rot on the tree and make some guesses about the cause, and this causes our cat villain to reveal herself to the audience to send a message to her boss that the characters are closing in on the secret. This was an interesting introduction to a villain. Basically the boss says to kill them and she's like, I don't feel comfortable killing them, and the boss is like, it's them or you. I think they were apprehensive to make her too evil because they intend for her to have a redemption arc, but like, then it's not much of a redemption arc if you weren't really a bad person to begin with. And, and now the villain feels like less of a threat or very impactful. It is more unique though, I can't say I've ever seen this before. Like maybe a redemption arc isn't going to be impactful, but maybe there's a different direction you could take a character like this. It also would have been cool if this was like a greater point about her character or like had some indicator of depth, but it just seems like she has a moral compass, I guess. 
So it doesn't feel like adding anything to this is, adding this is like really adding anything at all. But hey, that's all for episode seven. This is like the opposite problem of anime where they're finding any excuse to show a panty shot. This is like the hilarious opposite where the skirt defies gravity to not show a panty shot. Episode eight. Episode eight starts with a recap of the villain with the moral compass. She, she's like, they haven't told anyone. We don't have to kill them. And then, and then we get probably the most baffling and underrated line reading in the show. I don't think we need to kill them. They're not worth our time. <laughs> Olive, we knew you'd balk. So let. <laughs> I actually don't know what this line is. Someone is supposed to be like someone tell me what he's saying. Anyway, he reinforces that she needs to kill them, and she comes up with her own evil plan to kill them at the festival. Maybe. She's still apprehensive. But the buff cat, now a normal cat, hears it and goes to turn himself back into the buff cat to tell the girls. I'm not sure why he didn't do that before to tell the girls about the cat girl. I thought he knew. This moral compass thing is, is weird from a spectacle sense, but I don't mind it. The character works logically and there's an element of characterization in how she keeps putting it off and making excuses while framing it as like she's the evil one. Like, uh, Okay, okay, I'll do it. But first, I'll do what I do best. So some discord. Might as well make it fun. This, this is good. She, she's definitely the best, uh, the, sorry, the second best character in the show. But before we get to any of the plot, we gotta have melodrama. Out of fucking nowhere while we're at the festival, Rose, best friends apparently with Sage, calls her fucking cynical for being suspicious of the cat girl who gave them pen flips. And she gets offended at this because of course you would. Was this really it's necessary? Festival. What a fucking Sheesh, jump. Cynical. And then in the next scene with them, Rosemary changes her mind after apparently promising to do a certain activity at the festival with her for no reason other than she thought it sounded boring, even though she already accepted to do this. so. And then like things escalate until we get the only good line to come out of this melodrama. Stay very still. These women are about to release years of pent up resentment. Can you imagine how many horrible insults they've been saving up? Let's watch. But was it really necessary to drive like a wedge through these characters we believe to be friends up until now? Like it just takes away a dynamic and ruins our impression of Rosemary. I talked about melodrama before. Uh, don't get me wrong, there is a wrong and a right way to do it. My go-to example is uh, usually Amethyst from Steven Universe. For the first half of the first season, she's very rebellious, like a very rebellious character who's constantly starting shit and pushing buttons with the rest of the group. And to be fair, this character is kind of fucking annoying. Even when well done, melodrama is kind of a trade-off. But the payoff to the melodrama comes a lot later when she decides to run away with the main character and she ends up showing him where she was first born. For her context, Steven Universe is about space aliens born out of rocks that came to conquer Earth but lost due to a rebellion within their own kind. Pearl and Garnet were part of the rebellion, but Amethyst actually appeared after the rebellion from a gem making farm on Earth that they had shut down. Because this farm saps life from the planet as it is, and is a terrible reminder of what happened, they hate this place and want to keep it a secret from Steven, the main character. But Amethyst, who was born here, has been internalizing this as everyone hating her because she was a product of this farm, which perfectly explains why she acts out the way she does. Point is, melodrama works best when it's given context with something more core to the character. And you can't do this if you never show the melodrama until the episode where you explain it. In High Guardian Spice, these characters have never expressed true disdain for each other like this, whereas something like Steven Universe is full of examples of them like not getting along before you dive into why they act the way they do. To be fair, the plot tries to pretend that this is at least core to their characters. When we were kids, you had fun just being around me. You didn't need us to go spelunking into some stupid volcano full of hot knives just to consider it a fun day, and you were never, never this annoying. Sage implies that Rosemary has changed and that she never needed to, uh, she never used to need to go spelunking into a stupid volcano full of hot knives just to consider it a good day. But not only has this not been shown before, it's not even relevant to this scene. It's a dispute over carnival games. I actually think this idea that Rose has changed could have been really good foundation for like melodrama if executed better. You could say that after Rose's mum left, Rose has been slowly getting more and more desperate to chase adrenaline and adventure, and when Sage and Rose finally have a big confrontation to this, it finally comes out that Rose is terrified that her mother left her because she wasn't good enough. If Rose had become a guardian faster, maybe Rose's mum would have taken, her, uh, taken Rose with her when she left. 
And now she feels like she desperately needs to play catch up and she can't enjoy anything anymore. She feels like she's failed and has to make up for it. But when she's adventuring, when she's risking her life, that's the only time she feels close to her mum anymore. I briefly thought maybe that this was what they were actually trying to communicate, but the further we get, the less it's going to make any sense and I'm going to be, I'm just like pretty convinced this wasn't what they're trying to go for at all. It's just, this is just really out of nowhere melodrama with no real establishment or logical through line, which is a shame. <clears throat> oh, also, tree TSD! And then she runs away and decides she's going to travel t by herself back to the forest. This show does not know how to write characters in a way that's not awkward. <laughs> this isn't as much an engagement problem as it is a brainstorming tangibles problem. They had no idea how to convince her to change her mind and leave early. Although to be honest, why didn't you just start by doing this going on last episode? She had the vial. Oh, so actually I should mention at the start of the festival we introduced another bully character just to later bully one of the bully characters we started with. This bully character is actually related to one of the minor characters. This is splitting hairs at this point, but this is good. It's, it's always good to connect things in your world. I had a whole video with Arcane if you want to watch that. Anyway, Snapdragon dresses as a mermaid and the bully character makes fun of him for it, or more, he thinks he's a girl and gets insecure about it when he realizes he's not. I think characterizing Snapdragon by dressing as a girl for a costume party is good characterization of his core character trait. Goes along with the Wandering Muscus line of finding interesting ways to express something that isn't in itself an engagement. The bully, eh, not so much, it just kind of feels rammed in. Honestly, it kind of feels like a lot like uh, Ruby with its arbitrary bully arc at the start, where they just lift something that happens in real life, stick it in the story and play it out completely straight like it's engaging. If this was an actual character rather than a generic bully, you literally just introduced this episode to make Snapdragon feel insecure, it might have been better, or maybe like add more of a plot to it. Like maybe this character is a man whore who already has a girlfriend, but hits on people who don't know him or don't know he has a girlfriend, so his girlfriend doesn't find out. There's rumors he's a cheat, but no one knows for sure, and his girlfriend always believes her boyfriend over the rumors. Maybe use this at first to characterize Snapdragon as chivalrous and romantic. He's already got the gentleman aesthetic with the thin build and the rapier, but you could also say he's chivalrous because he fell in love with the knights in shining armor and the charming princes in the books he read as a kid. Or maybe his love style when he like played one as a, in a school play. But upon Upon seeing this bully, he expresses disdain for this guy and they build a bit of a rivalry. You'll notice this does a bit to characterize him more than just his dysphoria. He grew up with macho men but he ended up falling in love with the elegant princes and knights in shiny armor he read in fantasy. And it's not until later he realizes he didn't really want to be the princess he loved as a child, he wanted to be the princess that fell for the prince. He just misread his infatuation. Or maybe he does like both and can't decide, leading to the gender questioning stuff. But then at the festival, Amaryllis suggests dressing as a mermaid to costume match. He obliges, because of course he does, bully hits on a random girl, and boom, Snapdragon. And he's like, oh fuck, because now Snap knows for sure he's a cheat, and he turns it back on him like, go admit to your girlfriend that you are cheating, or I'll do it for you. That way it's a bit of a revenge story. But then the bully turns it back on him, and is like, ah, I'm just pretending, he says. Ha, there's no way I'd mistake you for a girl, do you actually think you look convincing? What a joke. He's lying of course, but it plays on Snap's insecurity even if he doesn't quite know why it bothers him. Uh, and it bothers him so much that he just drops it. With Amaryllis to the rescue and the scene playing out like normal. You're messed up! Funeral director, huh Cal? You better get out of here before the funeral becomes your own! I'm obviously dressed as a groom. Who'd wanna marry that? I don't know, just, just, you know, just add a little bit of spice to it. We'll get to it when we get to it, but a lot of the gender questioning uh, arc I have issues with because it reads a bit too much like a Wikipedia entry. Same with the first trans scene. I feel like I feel like this was probably the point though that this was supposed to be a stand-in for all gender questioning kids. You know, keep it vague so it relates to everyone. But pff, I'm sorry, I hate this. And you can go through my backlog and find me talking about this. I've always had the idea of relatability as grounds for characters. Diversity aside, a ton of people already subscribe to the idea of having the blandest possible main character to fit as many people into it as possible, or try to match them as closely as possible to the majority of their target audience, like neat otakus. But there's just no evidence it makes a difference. Yes, there are popular shows with these characters, but if you try to look for the unpopular stuff, these are by far the most common character types you find. 
Meanwhile, really popular characters are all often from very, like, very diverse from each other and have huge differing qualities from their audience. Solo leveling has a huge western following despite obviously being Korean. What's relatable about a princess? Someone born with power from birth? Is, is Disney making a mistake with its princess model? Or are they a billion dollar company? For God's sake, Wally's a fucking robot. <laughs> And it's not just about diversity in race and class. Even for bland as fuck pizza dough characters, who talks about these? Where's the evidence these characters have more of an impact on audience more than characters with more specific traits? No, there's the only tangible evidence of characters having an impact, video essays, fan art, fan fiction, conversation, character polls, they all point to these characters who are vastly different. Murderers, bombastic idiots, bullies, and above all else, People with unique and interesting thought out dreams, passions, motivations, and actions. I'm not saying you can't have a trans character, I'm saying you have to give me more than a trans character. I don't want to see the story of every trans character homogenized into a vague mush. I want to see the story of this trans character. Anyway, I'll build on this later. So Time meets Neppy Cat and finds out about the plot to turn them into stone. They all get together and track down the cat for their face off. Uh, they then fight, uh, some good animation here, and then they smash Time's vial. Oh no! Can't can't you just can you just go back there? There was like a whole pool. It's it's free access. You killed the guards. No time plot. She casts the spell and it backfires off Sage spell and turns everyone in the festival, including Parsley, to stone. Episode nine. Now in episode nine we pick up straight back off from where the last episode left off with their confrontation with Olive after the spell goes awry. You know. Honestly, credit where credit's due, I think the action and conflict segments with Olive are quite good. As we've seen with Amaryllis, when the writers are allowed to write bitchy, like, bitchy characters, they do quite well. That, that probably doesn't mean anything about the writer's IRL. But when that bitchiness gets put into an actual antagonist role, there's a good bit of back and forth. Like, she brings out Rosemary's recklessness with her taunting, so she charges after her, away from her friends, and even while running away, there's good moments to characterize her. She has trickster qualities that are quite endearing. Hmm. Fight me! Olive also just makes a good first impression with her not just fighting, but planning out who she'll take out first based on what she knows about them, and successfully manages to take out everyone except Rose, who she intended to take out last because she thought she was unarmed, but actually her sword is concealed under her clothes. Which actually, now that I've thought about it, is actually a cool moment for her character, because she has outright stated that she always brings her sword even to safe places because you never know when you need it. That's a really subtle characterization, but like, it actually crystallizes one of her opinions that was originally just kind of a throwaway line. Damn, that's a pity actually. I'm, I'm only catching this now because I forced myself through this show, but if I, there was more genuine investment driven in these characters, it probably would have been like a lot more appreciated. There's also very subtle characterization moments uh, from time where Sage thinks it's her fault, uh, but she's like, no, Olive, Olive did it. This is, war. this is war. I don't know, this just makes her feel stronger as someone who cares about her friends, but still doesn't drop the strong persona. Actually, this whole thing of Sage blaming herself for this on reflection is related to a similar idea on where Sage can't control new magic and ends up hurting someone, but they don't really commit to it here because it's clearly not her fault, which is the same problem we'll get later. I'll talk about it in a bit. You'll notice I've mostly complimented this episode so far, even though this is the part of the series that uh, before I said is where it falls apart. This is mainly because the the later world building and right now melodrama. And not just for Rose and Sage. I actually skipped over something last episode. Basically, Snapdragon doesn't want to talk about his problems to Amaryllis after this scene, so they basically so they just like they randomly decide to play the game they're sitting next to rather than talk about it. This functions as the whole B plot for half of two episodes. She goes, you want to talk about it? He says, no, we watched them play some of the game. Repeat. I don't know why we decided to spend time on this. It's actually really frustrating. The only good thing that comes out of this is Anne puts up a spell to block out the sound so they can not talk in peace. And that spell ends up being used to block the stone spell at the expense of the barrier, which leaves them hilariously running around all these fragile stone statues without a clue. The logic of this with VR and why they only started moving around this much after the spell went down is a bit whack, uh, but the irony is there. This joke here is a similar extension of that. Is my brain melting or are there more frozen students than before? Irony in concept is, is good, but the logic isn't quite there. And same thing here. Ah! Unfreeze them faster! Ow! 
actually hurt. This game is super realistic. Maybe we win by destroying the frozen people. Come on, help me smash them. No, that's, that's. And then this leads into like more melodrama of Snap being like, stop bossing me around. Like that was the problem, even though that had nothing to do with the initial incident that made him salty. In fact, she defended him. So I don't know what, Anyway, it's like halfway through the episode before they run into the rest of the cast, at which point we get a little bit of exposition about which country, which both Amaryllis and Sage are from. It's nice characters have and uh, make connections as per usual. Uh, but you find out that the stone spell was actually a sort of portable ready-made spell that's easy to cast. Uh, in fact, it's so easy to cast that Sage worries about how so much power uh, being so easy to access without a knowledge could be dangerous. Which, to be fair, is a distinction from old magic, albeit quite a meta distinction, i.e. it's a perspective on the downside of using an otherwise superior weapon. I think it's supposed to be a gun control analogy, but, uh, and like, if the story stuck to this and centered around this, this might have been good, but ultimately it does nothing to explain the confusing stuff in the past or in the future. You know, I was hoping for like more of a tangible difference, like the difference between chemtech and hextech in arcane. Like in arcane, there are two forms of, let's call it magic. They have different visual signifiers and do some slightly different things. Just like in High Guardian, one is superior to the other because it doesn't have side effects. But what accounts for the variation in uses is that one is cheap and originates from the undercity and is like, and one is like expensive and it originates from the high class side. This actually would have been perfect for High Guardian Spice. Old magic is practiced because it's cheaper. Easy. That's what I was looking for. Unfortunately, what we got is that one is a superior version to the other because it doesn't require extra work. And then we break even that at random and sometimes have new magic require work. Or at least people profess themselves as new magic exclusivists doing what we've been led to believe as old magic. <laughs> Anyway, as this happens, Rosemary chases Olive to an alley, and we get a face-off between the two of them. Really good animation here, uh, this is, but this is probably a good time as any to talk about one-liners. You turned my friend to stone. Not that you'd understand, but I'll never give up on any of my friends. I have friends too. The people who dangle string in front of your cat face don't count. <sighs> One-liners are a branch of comedy or irony. I actually did like a video on comedy like five years ago where I defined comedy as an uh, as a contrast of opposites. But this doesn't make sense. For example, this promotional image from Attack on Titan has a contrast of opposites, but it's not funny. See, it's missing one element, which I've been calling wrong association. What happens if we change our main character to a baby? It, it becomes a little bit funny, doesn't it? That's what I call wrong association. Something associated to this irony feels wrong. So a one-liner, or even something that's supposed to look cool, like this promotional poster, is what I call a contrast of opposites with right association. This example here is actually both. It's trying to be funny and cool because depending on whose perspective you view it from, it's either has a right or wrong association. From Ollie's perspective, she's wrong about the definition of friends, but from Rose's perspective, she's the one burning her on her definition of friends. So I think this is a good one-liner in concept, but the problem with this, though, is the dialogue. Like, we talked about this before, it feels like your characters are bending over how they backwards, like, and, like, going against how they normally speak to basically walk themselves into the setup line, and, uh, the, like, lets them get clowned on. It takes away from the book. Like, uh, it's a bit of a jump for Rosemary to think that just because Olive turned her friends to stone that she doesn't understand what it's like to not give up on friends, and then it's also a bit of a jump for all of it to follow this with, I have friends too. Like, you're clearly walking into the line the writers are trying to set up. You've just, you've got to disguise it better. Because it's just like the intelligence thing, right? Where it's like you need to find excuses or to, to blend things in so it looks like it, there was a reason for it to be there in the first place, not that you just put it there. Anyway, the conclusion for this fight is that she cuts Olive and she runs away until all of them meet up and corner her in the square, knocking away a Terrasphere. And then we're straight back into the melodrama. Olive jumps for her Terrasphere and Sage shoots her with magic. It creates a flash and she gets away. Even though Rose could have easily picked the thing up when she had the chance, this is a justification for her to- Sage, uh, I needed to do something. Oh, and that's what you went with. I'm not perfect. Neither are you. Uh, that's what I've been trying to tell you about myself, who does dumb stuff all the time. Guys. Uh, I actually thought your character was okay until these last two episodes. What the fuck are you talking about? So they use a spell and reverse it, and then they all sit on the rooftops and talk. And then, 
where things really start to mount, they say they can't tell anyone about this because according to Olive, there are spies from their organization everywhere. So the girls might be overheard if they try to tell anyone. Then we should tell the triad what's happened. We can't. You heard her. The Academy's crawling with spies. If we tell anyone, we'll be overheard. That's not how spies work? You're thinking of hostages. You don't tell anyone about something when there are spies involved because that thing is sensitive information that you don't want to get into enemy hands. But the thing you're hiding is literally the fact that enemies are after you. I think the enemies already know that. Now if there was a hostage, that'd be different. You couldn't get your own allies involved because the enemy can threaten them. It's like they were just like, quick, we need a reason for them to not run to the authorities. I know, there are spies. I saw that in a movie once. <laughs> Like, if you're gonna do that, just, just don't explain it. Let your audience create a reason. Anyway, Snapdragon invites Sage to come see the band with him, and when Amaryllis and Rose try to invite themselves, they get shut down because of this stupid fucking melodrama. Look, I like the idea of main characters switching up their best friends with a Deuteragonist pair, which is effectively what we do at, at next episode. That's daring and creates a good sense of change in a story without dumb, huge world ending plot beats. It also gives a great emotional writing, uh, gives us like great emotional writing to see characters who are best friends throughout the whole story break up and seeing the ripple effect that that brings out in their emotions. If you nail the character logic on this, I would have genuinely been excited for the next episode to see like the fallout of this and the new character dynamics, but my god, did you not have the logic for this shit? Especially Snapdragon. In the early episodes, sure, but in this episode, they went a totally different direction with her character. She was nice to you until you started being salty. I... <sighs> episode 10. Episode 10 starts with a creepy story, which is hilariously apparently in the middle of the day, which this is a good little joke. The creepy story is a metaphor for what time is doing in a different part of the world, which is... Totally regressing on a fucking character for no fucking reason. Yay! Despite all of this work we've gone through with her clearly coming out of a shell, out of no fucking nowhere, she goes on a dangerous mission alone, and then by far the most frustrating line comes out of this when Parsley follows her. Ian, you can't hide this from a friend. Roommate. Actually, what the fuck are you doing? This comes out of nowhere. She's just, she's just a roommate now? Are you kidding me? Parsley literally said you were friends in the cave of Vinca. We're your friends. And you smiled. You're telling me you're just still roommates now? Were you cuddling here for fucking warmth? Are you a fucking penguin? I'm sorry. I'm actually frustrated because this was one of the few good suits and it's fucking ruined now. It's not that you can't make a character regress like this, but there has to be a reason. Take Zuko. After chasing his destiny for the whole show, he finally accepts a normal life after fulfilling his destiny stops being an option. And he realizes how unhappy continuing to chase it has made him. Then, suddenly, he gets everything he wanted offered back to him on a silver platter, and he gives in and turns back. That would be how you do it. So in this episode, time is trying to... She's going to... Her plan is, uh... <laughs> I'll just let this play out. I create the salt circle to cast the spell, which summons the demon. I give him something precious. He opens a window for me to speak with my dad. I tell dad the most resourceful person I've ever met, about the healing water. He uses his knowledge to replicate the formula. We save the fairy woods. So, <clears throat> rather than just get more healing water from the fucking hole three episodes ago, her plan is to get a sketchy telephone demon to call her dad so she could describe the water to him, at which point he's going to reverse engineer the formula from a description. Hey, Dad! It looked like water! Okay, good luck! Glad I could help! <laughs> this is so contrived. Even more hilarious, Parsley's counter to this isn't, that's fucking dumb, it's, that cat girl might be out here, before it pans out to the middle of fucking nowhere. She might still be out here. We shouldn't be summoning anything. And then she's like, we should tell the triad. This is a good idea. So time ignores it and proceeds. So thankfully, this plan goes awry, and the demon gets out, so we don't have to suffer the cringe that is Time's dad is trying to explain to her that he can't just replicate mystical healing water from a description. They fight for it for a bit, but then Time wants to capture it to, like, fulfill its initial purpose and get, like, the answers and talk to her dad and shit, presumably. So they do so, uh, and they capture it. And then, completely unprompted, she changes her mind and shoots it in the head before saying the most hilariously fitting line in the show. Wait, wait, girls. Perhaps we can work out a... No. 
You were right. This was a waste of time. Literally, this whole B plot was the most nonsensical, pointless time waster I've ever seen in this show. It didn't even waste time, it regressed time's character. It put us back in time. Fucking. No more running off and no more secrets. We're friends, time. Oh, are you? Are you fucking sure about it? Don't worry, there's always fucking next episode. Also, this demon is like a mist thing that's not tangible. Time beats this with magical nesting. Parsley says this is smart. It's not. The, this goes along the same lines as the dragon egg stuff a few, like, episodes ago. Um, although this is actually very similar to One Piece. It actually has, like, a similar problem uh, with this with, with Usopp, where he'll pull out some crazy new slingshot ammo from his bag that's conveniently a solution to every problem. So cool, you just happen to have that answer in that little bag there we never get to see. What else do you have in there? Maybe the writer? The other plotline for this episode is picking up from the stupid melodrama from last episode. Sage is still angry at Rosemary and Snap at Amaryllis, so the two get together and hatch a plan to get their best friends back. Amaryllis, of course, wants to do something immoral to get them back, which is all normal for her. There's a lot of good lines here, as usual. Why does it require lizards? Lizards are the rice of magic. Super versatile, easy to cook. <gasps> uh, so they have the idea to expose all their bad memories, so they see them and then they don't like each other. This episode's full of great ideas. But to be fair, this one's this one's kind of fun at least, so rather cool. Meanwhile, Sage talks to Snapdragon and tries to explain the conflict between her and Rose, but none of it really makes sense, at least when compared to what we've seen. She sees that uh, Rosemary was good at helping her with her anxiety, and she was good at mellowing out her reckless tendencies, but she's changed lately. Snapdragon... What kind of fucking name is Snapdragon? That, uh, it's just dawning on me now. Is that his birth name? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Snap says that this is because Sage has changed, but that doesn't really explain it to me either, and it just kind of comes off as trying to make this drama between them more deeper than it actually is. Like, the idea of Rose and Sage balancing each other out for a dynamic I, I, I like, but I, I also feel like this really wasn't shown, at least in any way that really mattered. If it was, it would have nicely explained why they're best friends and why they work so well together, and it might help me piece together what they mean when they say they change to result in this melodrama. But when it comes to Snapdragon, I can't even try to fucking piece together why he's angry because he doesn't even fucking try to explain why he's annoyed at her. I honestly, honestly, I really want to like this scene. It has a new character dynamic. They're talking about something important. It's all very comfy. We get to see the main setting in a new rainy mood. It's all, it, and it's like part of the wind down period after the climax of last episode. But the character logic is all messed up. I just don't understand why these characters are here or saying what they're saying. And it's just, that's just disappointing. So Rosemary tries to stop the spell going off and it backfires, sending all their worst memories all around. And they have to go chasing them around with the bottles. This is actually one of the more creative shenanigans of the show. And this line's good. Oh hi Leland! If you tell anyone I vertically face planted because of how dreamy Leland is, I'll turn you into a lizard and keep you in a box in my room. Got it? <laughs> Threaten me with something that isn't one of my life goals. This is like much better like what the fuck humor. I, you don't know why Parnell has this as a life goal, but it fits his weird character and the core irony of this isn't the what the fuck part that's it itself, it's Amaryllis's threat being received as a good thing. While short, it's a good dynamic between these two. Apologizing to Sage is rough. She's so perfect. Perfect? She was being pretty mean back there. But she was. What, what the fuck did Sage do? Rose flaked on her plans, she agreed to, and then said it was because Sage was boring. What the fuck do you mean? This whole melodrama feels like it's emulating other more well done melodrama. They try to go for like, the you both fucked up and should apologize to each other. But since Rose started this shit with a completely unwarranted, uncharacteristic comment, the only way I could make sense of this was that Rose spontaneously changed. But this, but the show just tries to sell you on it being like much more grey than it actually was. Like the melodrama was much more genuine and understandable. But it's not. Anyway, it's solved by them saying sorry at the end of the episode. That's really all there is to it. Amaros kind of says sorry to Snap. Uh, and Snap tells her she doesn't have to be mean all the time, even though it bothered him last episode and she was actually being really nice to Snap last episode. What the fuck are you talking about? And Rose and Sage say they're sorry for the things they said without any context for why. If anything, they make their why they're angry at each other more confusing with Sage bringing up being a guardian is scary or something. 
But what prompts this conversation is honestly one of the best scenes in the show. So this conversation is prompted by her chasing down a memory of her crying about her mum asking why she'd leave. And after she apologises to Sage, she goes up to the memory and says... <laughs> is... is mum coming back? I'm on it, kiddo. I'll keep you posted, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fucking adorable. A now much older, more competent Rose looks at her past memory and knowing how bad she felt back then, cheers herself up. It's completely sentimental, she doesn't need to do it, but she does it anyway because she knows how much pain that memory is in. It's just a really sweet thing for her to do and it shows how much she cares about finding her mom, told in this really unique way. Beautiful. In fact, this is it. This is my favourite moment in the show. Wait, why does she have brown hair? Wasn't it implied to be hereditary? Does their whole family dye their hair pink? Episode 11! Episode 11 opens on a fight with a tentacle monster, which is kinda cute, and then they stab it and its guts pour out, oh god. <laughs> but then it opens up and it's actually a robot controlled by Professor Caraway. Okay, I'm still kinda traumatized though. What the hell is this cheering? <laughs> So this thing is all basically a test to see who's ready to go on an actual Guardian mission. This is, this is kind of a minor point, but it's weird that they, they're they going on like real missions so early, especially when they're about to like royally fuck it up. I'm reminded of Hero Academia and how it like has a specific hero license that plays into the plot a lot. This is, of course means there's less excuses for action, but it gets around it by like forcing the action on the characters and having them intentionally have to break the rules. It just feels a lot more fleshed out and gives the characters more choices to make. But as I say, this is very minor. <clears throat> anyway, the mission is to go help some mermaids fix their pet dragon that's gone crazy and is now trying to hunt them. There's actually a second teacher who gives them the ability to turn into mermaids, but just like Caraway, she isn't going to help or even supervise in any way despite this being a real mission. We'll get to it. But before that, as they travel to their destination on boat, this is a good use for a magical stuff for once, Snapdragon and Cal have an argument as they seem to not be over their previous beef from three episodes ago. Oh, now Amaryllis isn't the reason you're angry. Cal makes fun of him and calls him a girl for dressing like one, Snapdragon gets insecure and punches him, at which point he jumps ship and swims back to the academy. I, I guess this was his entire purpose this episode. Thankfully for once, the teacher is disapproving of literal fucking violence, so that's nice. But also at the end of the episode. Uh, I'm not in trouble anymore? <laughs> well, that's up to you. He also somehow x-ray scans Snapdragon's arm and is like, your wrist is broken, you're gonna stay on land with me watching the surface of the water be completely fucking useless. I should be out there with the girls. I need you as lookout. We all serve the mission in different ways. How, 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 how do you serve the mission? P please, tell me. It's honestly hilarious how contrived this is. The whole point of this is to give Snap time alone with the uh, the trans teacher to push his gender questioning arc, but the logic to get there is so clunky. Every now and then we cut from the A plot about mermaids and Snap like, looks through his binoculars and sees like the tail of the water dragon. He's like, there, yeah, I see it. I see it. <laughs> well, Where mission accomplished, doing? motherfucker. You've done your job. Like, what are you up here for? Caraway says they're up here for lookout. And I'm like, yeah, I guess that checks out. You looked out over the lake and you saw the dragon. Wait, is that it? So from here, Caraway presses snap and we get a flashback of a super macho upbringing he had that gives context for why he's so insecure about Cal calling him a girl. And from there, it moves on to into him like admitting his feelings of dysphoria and Caraway floating the option of transition magic. And he's like, oh, cool. I feel a lot better about it now. I'll think of this. This is actually probably a good time to talk about Snap's uh, gender questioning arc. So maybe this arc is okay. I've seen a bit of positive talk about this arc, and there is there is one moment at the very end that actually made me feel something. But overall, I think it's a weak basis for a character, because gender questioning, it isn't really an opinion as much as it is an affliction. If this went with the gender idea of getting to choose your gender as an element of self-expression, this could be used as characterization instead, but this goes very much along the lines of gender dysphoria, where there's an inexplicable sadness that comes from feeling like you're not in the right body. This means, unlike for example a tragic backstory, there isn't some character-based context for why this character is like this, or any informed rationale to explain it, so that means this feels more like a character with a disease they don't know there's a treatment for, rather than an element of depth or anything to do with, like, have an arc over. 
Now again, not saying you can't have a trans character, but an arc about them transitioning is much weaker than what you'd normally think of like in, like in Wandering Musuko, a lot of the arc is about character building and becoming confident enough to come out and own it. And it results in an admittedly really cool scene where she's just like, fuck it, I'm coming to school in a dress. But in High Guardian Spice, it's delivered very systematically. They, they characterize this trait and the insecurities over it, and then Karaway is like, here's your answer, and he's like, wow, this is my answer, thank you. It doesn't really feel like an arc or anything specific to the journey of this character and their choices. Just, it just feels like I'm kind of reading the Wikipedia page on transgender. A scene like this could be played as an indicator of depth or give context to a character. Like, personally, if anything, I'd have the trans reveal of Caraway be here rather than where it was. That way it's revealed to draw a commonality between two characters rather than just to be there. Although this only works if you assume Snapdragon's trans arc is engaging too. Otherwise, you're just drawing a connection to something that the audience isn't interested in either. I'd also probably give Caraway opinions and a style of magic that embraces things like change and experimentation. Have him be working on a new spell or trying out a new fashion style or hobby every time you see him. Have him talk about how his guardian vows, to go along with my own cave canon, uh, was to always play devil's advocate, advocate, to never stop challenging what it means to be human and what it means to practice magic because he believes that's how we progress and how we help people. All this would mean that when the reveal comes up, it clicks as to why he is the way he is. Transitioning has fundamentally changed the way he sees the world, because when he was younger, he was curious, experimented, and ultimately took a, the plunge with a big risky change that would totally out alter how people see him, and yet, he feels like he was all the better for it. As a result, he embraces change, risk, and experimentation because it's worked for him in the past. This gives us the Onyong Kapon style opinion we talked about last time. If we remove Snapdragon for a sec and just talk about how I'd redo the Caraway scene, I'd probably take this very change and experimentation to find character and do a bit more with them before the reveal. If you're looking for a straight chance reveal, you could probably, you could have like one of your main characters be on the precipice of a big choice that's going to affect their life. Maybe make a big deal about Sage plunging into new magic, and then you can have Caraway come up to give advice and attend an open moment between the two of them, he's like, I had to make a big choice like this too. And she says, what was it? And he says, I'll tell you a secret. I used to be a girl. And Sage is like, wait, what? And he says that I'm trans. It was the first big terrifying change I ever had to make, but I've been happier ever since. Maybe taking on new magic will be the same for you. Sage says, that's why you're always pushing us to experiment, isn't it? To which he replies, it's what magic is for. Trust me, I've never regretted trying anything new. Or if you're looking for something with more flair and a bit more openness about revealing his trans, you could say maybe he teach lessons at first specifically about thinking outside the box. He says, new magic can do anything. If you want to be guardians, you must unlearn what you thought you knew and expect the unexpected. Maybe he'll test them by showing them a photo of a bunch of different kids and ask them, who did I used to be? They'll go through and as you'd expect, they'd only choose boys in the photo, at which point he'll say, all of them failed the test because they weren't thinking with the possibilities of new magic. Maybe then they have an excursion or adventure where the teacher shows them that magic can solve every normal problem, but also the chaos can create like a million more, but you must embrace that, go outside the box. He reinforces that in a world of magic, change is lifeblood. Think creatively, and when the characters face conflict and use magic creatively to overcome it, they think back to the photo in class and realize they were looking at it all wrong. The photo is a trick. Instead of looking at who looks most like Caraway, they need to be looking at someone least like Caraway, because Caraway has shown he's all about change. So of course he'd probably look the least like what he used to, or even anyone or anything he's seen before. The last idea I had was more of a wild card. It was to have a character that was really obsessed with manliness, which fits well with a trans character. Looking at like trans communities for five seconds will usually result in seeing something to the effect of, when I see X gender doing X gender associated thing, I wish I could that could be me so badly. But let's take it to 11. Let's have him be like, Armstrong mixed with Kamina. He's always talking about what it means to be a real man. He loves bodybuilding, cracking open a cold one with boys, test of strength, testosterone fills bars, getting into fights with strangers over the tiniest thing. And this is important, even proving his dominance over other men. That makes him feel super manly. Um, yeah, he's like that kind of guy. The type that to do like stupid hold by beer type shit that gets him hurt. Anyway, the main characters notice he's always drinking a potion, like Moody from Harry Potter, and they get suspicious of it because it's like a mystery. Then they try to find it out what it is by taking away his potion to see what happens, but back out at the last minute when they decide it's immoral. But then later they, with the teacher, fight an antagonist who specializes in putting down anti-magic circles and fighting their opponents hand to hand. 
In fact, this antagonist knows this teacher is biologically female and uses the anti-magic circle to get the edge on him in a fight. This, of course, reveals to everyone what he used to be, and it saddens him to know his class is seeing him like this. He tells his class the truth is, he loves everything about being a man, and every second he's not is pain. He turns to the antagonist, the rage beginning to take him, he says, I don't feel very manly right now, so I am going to beat the ever-loving shit out of you until I do. He proceeds with pure rage, beat the shit out of the antagonist despite being in a much less bulky, muscled female body. The antagonist clearly underestimating how relentless and ruthless he can be while enraged. Meanwhile, all the students that tried to take away his potions before changing their mind are all looking and feel like, holy shit, I'm glad we weren't the ones responsible for turning him back. I actually got this idea after reading another comment, and I floated it there. Uh, to be fair, some people were like, you can't do that, that's outing a trans person, it's very traumatic. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know if there's a good reason to be, to like not have something in a story. Even from a representation sense, I don't think it's good to have only representation that always shows everything in a completely normal, healthy, happy situation. I actually had a bit of this with the Voldemort rewrite, where people were like, you can't fridge Hermione, that's, it, that, that's, it, it's sexist. And I'm like, that's not a permanent change though, so like, why is this, is something bad happening to a female character enough reason to not have it happen at all? You can't add any character to a story and be like, this is my precious baby and nothing bad should ever happen to them. It's called conflict. And usually that conflict is centered around the elements of story you've established. So if you've established a character is trans, I think it's fair game to create an engagement for them to suffer conflict to do with them being trans. Not always, but like there shouldn't be a flat ban on it. If you don't do anything, you just you just get this. Very stock standard characters that feel less like characters with stories and more like stand-ins for very broad, vague understandings of all trans people homogenized into nothing. The show doesn't try to deepen Caraway or Snapdragon or use it to find new ways to characterize them. It seems to make being a point of the scene itself rather than use it as context for an engagement. What's a good analogy? We wouldn't make a character arc out of someone transitioning into an alien just to go through the play-by-play -play of how it happens. That's a documentary. But we would make a character arc about transitioning into an alien and how they feel about it. <laughs> Likewise, the story isn't there to show you the default transition experience, it's about the character's experience specifically and what it means for them. At least show me what, it, what they stand to lose by transitioning. Their home, their family, make it a choice that requires opinions. Maybe Snap has to admit that her macho father actually was right about her, and she's a pussy ass girl, but that eats her up inside until ultimately she decides that she has to accept that to be happy, like, fuck you dad, I am every insult you ever threw at me and I'm gonna go live my life as a girl now, goodbye. <laughs> I kind of like that idea. It's like the ultimate backfire of calling your son a pussy. <laughs> also, yes, I just spent a ton of time on this again, YouTube comments. Totally makes me a transphobe. It's not like I'm taking my time to explain that this, this is clearly as fucking possible or anything, so you don't bite my fucking head off. I got a couple of comments last time. It's kind of funny though, like 45% like of comments were like, I'm trans and you explained it perfectly why it felt forced. And then another 45% is like, I'm trans and I respectfully disagree with you on this. And here's why you're wrong. And then there's like just 10% who feel like they're going, I speak for all trans people and they want you to know you're an irredeemable, horrible bigot and this is the only reasonable way to interpret what you said. There is actually some semblance of the depth I talked about in the scene, although not explicitly with the trans stuff. It's in the scene where we get a flashback showing Snap had like a super macho upbringing. And this, this to be fair, gives a bit of context to his insecurities and why he's so angry about it. Though I tend to find depth is always about opinions and how they affect actions more than anything. If you like, if like, like you look at a deeper character like Zuko, it's not just I'm sad about my dad who kicked me out and I'm going to take my anger out on someone to who draws attention to it. It's also the opinions that's forged from that incident, mainly this idea about destiny and honor and what it means to him. And as the story progresses, you see this impact his choices and causes him to make these incredibly unhealthy decisions. I mean, his whole role in the story, the antagonist, is a product of his depth, restoring his honor. And as he develops, you see his shift in opinion. Honor and destiny are not things awarded to you by your family, it's something you earn and find out for yourself. That's why I look at this direct transition story and I'm like, I don't care, this isn't engaging. Even, even if you look at something like Wandering Musico, it's more 
It more uses this, as, this trance part as a jumping point for drama and character and how they cope with it and overcome it. It's not, I don't feel like myself. Haha, ha, you don't feel like yourself. Here's a potion you can take to feel like yourself. Oh wow, I feel like myself. Like, this character has no opinions. It might as well be a magical wound he had that he never realized before and he doesn't know why he's in pain and the teacher's like, this will fix you right up. It's not engagement. It's, it's busy work. Actually, you know, you know, you know what it's kind of like? It's kind of like a Lumi's Needle in Hunter x Hunter, where one of the characters has this issue where he prioritizes self-preservation over even his friends, even when he really wants to protect his friend. And it feels like this deep-seated issue about his upbringing ingrained in him. But then rather than that be something that could be rationalized by the character to overcome, it turns out that his brother placed a mind control needle in his head that told him to run away. And so he realizes this and he pulls it out and then he's good. That's what this is. I mean, this scene had some different positive qualities, but any other idea of depth just like comes out with a fucking needle. The only thing here that I think really has any kind of visceral emotional impact here is when Snapdragon comes home after all of this uh, is over and he just breaks down fry, cry, <laughs> frying, cry, <laughs> frying, breaks down frying. <laughs> And he just breaks down crying in front of Amarels. This actually made me feel something, to be honest. I'm not entirely sure why I like this. It's an engagement I call empathy in reference to your character's feeling emotion and then that emotion being mirrored in your audience. But I haven't really done much theory crafting on how to trigger it. The most I've managed to work out is that it's pretty heavily dependent, dependent on character investment because when I rewatch shows I like, some scenes that didn't make me cry in the first watch will actually make me cry in the second watch even though the show hasn't changed at all. What has changed though is my investment because I've known and had the chance to become more invested in a character because of all the moments with them after the point that made me cry as well. Oh, also, uh, there's one good line here too that goes along with the lines of uh, finding interesting ways to characterize it. I like your nails. Would you still like me if, if I painted my nails? Only if you promise to stick to flattering colors. Be serious. <laughs> Going back to the A-plot now, uh, it's pretty usual stuff with Low the Sea. They run away from the dragon, meet the mermaids, talk a bit. Rosemary is racist to mermaids or whatever. Do we have a signal in case anything goes wrong? Something like, uh... <laughs> they also do this fall in love at first sight bullshit. You fool! How will you scissor with a mermaid? Am I, <laughs> Am I the only one who hates this? To, to me, this is only really does anything if you try to characterize someone as perfect or popular or like the talk of the town. But when it's just a random new character, one of the cast is physically attracted to it, it it's like, as, as, good for you, man. Congratulations on your ovaries. Like, does your physical attraction really have anything to do with your character? I'd much rather have them start crushing based on their chemistry or something they have in common. Anyway, in a, an incredibly weird twist of fate, when trying to trap the dragon, Sage loses control of her magic and accidentally rips a giant wound in it. What? And then they, they commit to this too. It swims up, beaches itself on the surface, healing magic doesn't work on it, and they put it down? <laughs> What? So I'm conflicted on this episode. On one side, this was a bold move. It actually does make me feel things. Uh, while it's a minor character, having your character accidentally, accidentally kill an important living creature does have the consequence I was looking for all the way back when Rosemary broke her sword. But there's also so much weirdness involved. Like, if this was possible and it was really an important mi uh, mission, why are the teachers supervising? In a way, it probably would have been better if the teachers were like, what the fuck, Sage? How did you fuck this up so badly? Like this was a simple mission gone dreadfully wrong in an unexpected way. But then the teacher says, it's not really her fault, which kind of hurts the consequence. But then we get the most baffling line to explain this. No, it's not your fault, Sage. The effectiveness of new magic conceals how unmanageable it can be. Wow, if only she had a teacher who could have told her that. It's almost like Just you literally told her that new magic had no downside. Do the effectiveness of new magic conceals how unmanageable it can be. New magic is better. The effectiveness of new magic conceals how unmanageable it can be. Well, I was taught that old magic is sacred. <laughs> Maybe. But it's impractical. The effectiveness of new magic conceals how unmanageable it can be. Is it a 
okay if I use old magic? Sage, why crawl through the desert delirious with thirst when you can summon an oasis of sparkling water in any flavor you choose? This is definitely a follow-up from the gun analogy thing about new magic brought up a couple episodes ago, but like, this show has fucking long-term memory loss, and it just makes this whole event feel so weird. It's like, it's like one of those shock character deaths that come out of nowhere, but then nobody acknowledges it like came out of fucking nowhere. It, it's, it's, it would be like episode 5 of Attack on Titan where a bunch of the minor characters are killed by titans, only everything in the show suggested that this would be a cakewalk, and yet the characters aren't shocked when it happens, they're just kind of sad. That's not completely true. It's a shock to Sage's character, and that's good, but everyone else is just sad. I feel like we missed an important phase of like, holy shit, how did this happen? What the fuck? You killed our deity or whatever. Literally, the mermaids don't react to this at all, and the teachers look mildly surprised and sad, but they don't say anything in reaction. It just, it's like it feels rushed, that there were character reactions that should have happened, but just didn't. Instead, the mermaids are like, True responsibility relies with whatever made it crazy, which of course seems to be the rot, because they find some seaweed on it with rot. How is the rot supposed to be a secret again? <laughs> but I feel like we missed a bit. Aren't you angry the Guardians were sunbathing while they got their kids who didn't fucking even know how to use a terrosphere correctly to do this job? So again, ac according to the teachers and the mermaids, apparently Sage isn't really responsible for this and it saps the consequence. But like, this was daring, you should have committed to it. I, <laughs> it, it had a bit, but it wasn't there. Uh, but that's it for this episode, although we get a teaser with Olive who's still in the school. Diary. Oh, so judgy. What are you, my father? Oh my god, there's another one! Episode 12. Episode 12. Welcome to our final episode. So in our final episode, our secondary villain enters the scene. He's called Mandrake and has a decent introduction. The cute little kitty. Can I break its neck? Now, you might be expecting me to say, like, wow, that's edgy, but I actually kind of disagree with a lot of the way terms like edgy and Mary Sue are used. <clears throat> they're often used like flat criticisms now, even though uh, they're by definition about author intent. Like, a Mary Sue used to be specifically about being able to tell when an author was self-inserting a more awesome version of themselves into the story to, like, jack off to it. Generally what tips viewers off to this is that they actually fail to make the characters awesome or like sacrifice very important things in the pursuit of it leading you to you the viewer to understand this as a problem occurred because the author was trying to live vicariously through their own creation. But then people tend to apply the same logic to characters when they're just really powerful or confident. Even me, I actually did this with Gojo from Jutsu's Kaisan Adventure. <laughs> I was I don't know why I thought I was about to say that. <laughs> Even me, I actually did this with Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen, and to be fair, you can't contradict me. You don't know if the author was living vicariously through this character, so I can say it like it's flat criticism without ever needing to talk about how the character is written outside of the fact they're just really strong and witty and awesome. Hilariously, I had a video about on this about uh, like years ago when I talked about OP characters, but apparently I forgot and I failed to enjoy jo Gojo's character at first because of this, because I was like kind of turning up my nose uh, about it because of assumption I made about the author. It wasn't until I talked to a couple of people about it and saw how much good little reception this character was getting that I was like, wait, I'm being a pretentious fucking critic, aren't I? So I try to look at a character like this and not let my understanding of the author and their past work blind me. There isn't anything inherently wrong with this scene. For all you know, this character is actually a fucking psychopath who'd snap a cat's neck just for fun. It's not necessarily the author trying to say, hey, look how daring I am. I think because people don't like this show and they think the writers are hacks, they might be predisposed to look at this and go, oh, edgy, because they think the writers are trying to look hardcore. But if you pasted this into a more popular show in a place where it fitted, I'm sure no one would blink an eye. Conclusion is, if you're taking a story how it's supposed to be used as a piece of entertainment, then it should be taken at face value. Anyway, as weird as the villain with a conscious character is, Mandrake works as kind of a foil for her. With him being a psychopath and now also in command according to the higher ups, Olive is now forced to act. In the next scene, we pick up back with Sage and Rosemary at the end of class. We see they aren't over the Scypheth, the, the water dragon, yet. This is nice. I like Consequence, but unfortunately, it's seemingly just resolved in this scene. The Scypheth, isn't it? He's all I could think about. <sighs> Me too. Him and Olive. Sometimes I miss being a kid when we didn't have to deal with all this stuff. But at least we're dealing with it together. Always have. 
always will. Really? I seem to remember a specific time where you weren't over the dumbest fucking reason. The side path doesn't really come up anymore, but at the end of the episode, the, uh, the, the, the idea that she made a mistake gets a resolution, which is good in concept, but ugh. Then, out of nowhere, Rose's mum appears at the school, in, in secret, and leads Rose to a place where they can talk quietly, but it's actually Mandrake trying to find out who they've told about the rot so they can silence them. Let's ignore the fact that their plan is to kill those who know about the rot like it's not an incredibly obvious affliction everyone should know about by now. In some people already do, including Time's entire clan. This is, but this is like a very good use of a character's core trait. It feels like this consistent part of Rose's character has played into the plot because it's how the villains got the upper hand on her. This leads to Mandrake finding out who Professor Caraway has told before he kills anyone, which, because he's a shapeshifter, leads to a fun little who's who scene. And then, instantly ruined by. So in the middle of this fucking fight, Caraway takes his Terran Sphere and starts drawing fucking runes with it. Are you serious? What possible reason do you have for doing this? You use uh. old and new magic together. A solid foundation in old magic gives one the potential to merge their strengths. What strengths? The only strengths you've established is one, Sage Mom, but only Sage Mom plants a tree every time she casts a spell to like undo potential environmental damage. Two, a perspective on old magic that it's gated to only people who have a lot of experience rather than a lot of potential harm being at the fingertips of the inexperienced. But you're a teacher, you're the definition of experience, so you have no reason to use it like that, so what fucking strengths are you talking about? Even the thing we established just last episode, the effectiveness of new magic conceals how unmanageable it is, doesn't explain why you'd use it this way. You're experienced, you should be good at managing it. The other fucking teacher certainly seemed like it when she did anything. You're also sacrificing a ton of speed doing it this way, so what the fuck? And if this is such an important facet of new magic, why aren't you learning this in school? Why do you predominantly learn new magic here? Remember when you said that? Even if we ignore the contradictions of this retcon from last episode and take it at face value, now it just seems like old magic is clearly superior. Why even use new magic if it's unsteady and unmanageable and you just have to draw a fucking rune anyway? Maybe I could get it if it was just using old magic for big spells and new magic for small spells, but you're combining them. What does that mean? <laughs> God, this pissed me off the first time I saw it. Cause like, whenever they talk about magic, there's always so there's just always so fucking vague. And then when they do get specific, they they always introduce a new fucking concept that makes the previous things more confusing, and is usually never brought up again. At best, it makes sense for the context of the episode. There is zero dedication to consistency, and 12 episodes in, it really fucking shows. Seriously, what did drawing runes do in this scene? I thought maybe there was a limit on like how many spells you can do at once, so he got around it by doing one with old magic and one with new, but he actually draws runes both times with a terror spear, so that's not it. And a, a limit certainly hasn't been shown in the show before, anyway. Didn't you just make yourself slower for no reason? Couldn't you have made both spells with just new magic since you're experienced, or both with old to be more manageable? You clearly take the terror sphere away after you set out the first spell, so it's not like it's one spell at one time. I have, I have so many questions, but it's played off as this crazy thing that allowed him to do so much more, but for the life of me, I have no idea what- Oh my god, this show fucking gaslights you, I swear to god. There's no effort to make the world building consistent, and then it tries to do shit with it like, Hey, wasn't that genius? No, it makes sense, I promise. You're like, what made Makes sense. Oh, you know, I combined their strengths. Fuck off. This isn't even the only retcon. Later in the episodes, the bad guys trap the students and teachers in a burning building, and Amaryllis, the girl who said new magic was literally the only good way to do anything, takes charge to help them escape, and she splits the new magic and old magic into two groups to do two equal jobs, as if old magic is both useful for something, has its own strengths, and that there is an equal number of people here studying old as there are new. Why are there so many of you even here? They said they don't train old magic in this school. Because it's old, because it's fucking inferior. And now it's like, oh, they're equal, even though old magic is logically the superior one, because it's the only one that fucking shoots straight. And then the final cherry on top, the climax of this episode happens in, in the final fight with Mandrake, where Sage goes to fire a beam spell at him, but before she does so, she draws a rune with a terror sphere, and then she fires the beam and wins the fight. Fucking huh? <laughs> 
The only way I can generously interpret this is that she's using a similar spell to what she used on the water dragon, but she doesn't want to lose control of it, so she combines it with old magic to like steady the spell so she has a better handle on it. This kind of makes sense if you pretend for a second that new magic is the only magic that can create this kind of power, but there's never been established. In fact, episodes ago, we implied the opposite because when Sage says, so much power with no required knowledge or walk, how unsafe, Amarilla says, how old magic of you to say that? Implying this kind of power is possible with old magic, it just requires work. So it's like, just make the powerful spell old magic. Surely working with the thing you've studied for years is easier than fucking combining two types of magic at once for the first time. I mean, you had to draw the fucking rune anyway. I like the idea of combining the two to have basically like magical training wheels for new magic, but like why would Caraway need that? Maybe it was because he was doing two spells at once so he needed to steady himself? That kind of makes sense. <sighs> Honestly, half the ideas I come up with I only consider after watching the season twice and writing a video on it. So maybe I'm getting into too into like theory territory, or maybe there's just so much vague talk and retcons that I'm never sure what info I'm supposed to read into and what I'm supposed to ignore. Either way, I shouldn't be confused for this long. I mean, if you're gonna retcon until the end of the series, couldn't Caraway have just told us specifically what he meant in this moment when he mentioned strengths? Uh, with how flaky the show has been on details, it's it's probably much more reasonable to assume I'm reading too much into it, and it's just fucking gaslighting me again. Like Caraway could have just said this. It would have it wouldn't have even need to be any planning. It's the same episode. Anyway, going back a bit, Mandrake gets away with Olive and knocks out Caraway off screen weird choice but okay and then olive takes advantage of like end of term drink night to put all the teachers to sleep mandrake pretends to be caraway to give them the drinks and then it was supposed to be poison but olive changes it to put them to sleep instead as i said these two are good foils for each other and it was a smart way of not having mandrake just kill them instead they round up all the students into the same area lock them in and try to burn them alive the main cast don't get caught up in this, and instead they have a fight in the library, and then when Olive betrays and stabs uh, Mandrake, the fight moves outside where we get that moment from before. The spectacle in this fight is actually pretty good. Everything's on fire, there's a giant sword moment, and later we have a fight on broomsticks, where Rosemary fights with Sage by using her sword while on the back of the broom, like some weird wizard cavalry battle that shows off their partnership and their teamwork very well. It's not the most creative, but when the library catches fire, this is their extinguisher, which is genuinely great. And then they waste it by having actually normal firefighters put out the fires at the end of the episode. I kind of glossed over Olive's redemption arc. I suppose I should talk about that. Um, so like, as much as I like the villain with a conscious thing, you know, it's kind of unique, uh, but it really doesn't work for a redemption arc. Redemption arcs work when there's like, you know, an arc. Like, because this character already had a good sense of right and wrong, when she changed her sides, it's not surprising, it's it's not much of a development, there was no internal struggle of them weighing up what's right against what they want. Like, there's nothing wrong with this, it all makes sense, and it's technically a development, but, but comparing it against what it's like trying to achieve, or probably trying to achieve, it's very lackluster. But characters with really good redemption arcs, I'm just gonna keep using Zuko as an example, there's very specific moments that make up why he does the things he does, so he actually has to learn and experience things that actually change him. I suppose technically Zuko always had a moral compass, he cares for his men, uh, for instance, and early on it's shown that he won't get people killed to achieve his goal, but he'd still doom the world to Fire Nation rule and capture and imprison his enemies. He'd probably kill the Avatar too if that was what was required of him, but his redemption arc is all about what he's willing to do for what he thinks he wants and how he wants changes as stuff happens. He risks his life, he betrays his country just so he can be the one to capture Aang, he burned villages, he fought his sister, and only when he lost his chance to return and was confronted by Iroh by the absurdity of his desperation and how unhappy it had made him, he finally lets go and is finally able to smile at how happy his uncle is with his tea shop until everything he wanted is served to him on a silver platter and he gives in again. And then finally, after he gets everything he wanted, he realizes he'd just rather stay in that tea shop and he's racked with guilt with everything he's done. But this is just, why is she on the bad side again? I, <laughs> we didn't even get an answer on this that would have at least explained a bit about her choices and why she made them. All of this could be made better with opinions or things that actually made change rather than just struggling to do her duty. Like what changed exactly for her to do this? Nothing. Obviously she's scared, but what's the line of logic that gives her the confidence to turn it around? I think it's literally that she's like finally forced to be complicit in murder and, and that's it. It's, it's not really like an opinion or anything. 
Also, this fight has one of the most pointless versions of the important haircut trope. Sage gets trapped by a hair, and then she cuts it off to get free. Y yeah. <laughs> so normally when you, you do this, this is like evidence of a change in character, or at least that's when I've seen it being the strongest, particularly Sakura from Naruto. Sakura's hair is set up to have specific significance. The whole reason it's long in the first place is because she hears that her crush, Sasuke, likes long hair. This means sacrificing it is a lot more significant than it just being her hair. When she cuts it to get free, it means that there's been a change in her priorities. It says, I don't care if he loves me or not, my priority is now to become stronger so I can protect the people I care about. Anyway, after the fight, there's a bit of a cooldown period as they put the fires out and put emphasis on the damaged school. At first, I was gonna say destroying the school only really works with investment, but it, it looks like they just kinda went for superficial damage instead. Olive gets arrested, I guess. Kinda cool that they committed on that. It'll be interesting to see how she comes back on season two. Did I just imply I wanted season two? We then get some sappy dialogue as Rosemary cleans up her hair, but it all rings pretty hollow. Like, Rosemary sucks a dick for how cool she is for combining magics together, even though the audience doesn't know why it's cool, and Sage sucks Rose's dick for how good she is with a sword. Be still. Do you even know how great you are? Rose. You mixed old magic and new magic perfectly. I'm serious. You fought out there like a true warrior. You're a natural leader. These lines actually kind of make me cringe. It, it's a good example of cringe, actually, because you can tell the writers feel really good about the scenes they wrote, but in announcing it with such confidence, they clearly don't realize they weren't actually as good as they thought. I did a whole video on understanding cringe. I'm not going to explain it here, but if you want to watch that video, this is like this is like textbook example. Particularly the, there, you're like a, a true, true warrior. warrior. Like what? she says it with so much fucking conviction. Ugh. I'm sorry if one of the writers is actually watching this. This is probably really hard for you to hear. But for what it's worth, you actually sat through like two and a half hours of me being critical. Fucking good on you. I write my own stuff. I know how hard that is. Careful. I'm wielding a weapon, which you do with great competency. This line actually would be like cool if I felt like there was any progression in how she used the sword. Like there were moments at the start where she was incompetent and then moments at the end where she was competent, but there wasn't really any through line. It's not really an arc, just a difference you could see in a side by side comparison. And finally, we get our title drop as the main characters go to leave the school for the day. We had some sick moves yesterday, High Guardian Spice, because of our names. That's perfect. Yeah! You've probably heard this before, but their names are actually herbs, not spices. I'm sure everyone expects me to rag on this, but to be honest, nobody wanted this show to be called High Guardian Herb. That's just dumb. And finally, I suppose we should talk about the final twist. I should mention ahead of time, I'm going to use Invincible as an example of this. So if you haven't watched the first episode, skip here for the conclusion. So earlier in the episode, Olive says that Rosemary's mother is in witch country, and at the end of the episode, we see Mandrake, who escaped at the end of the episode, is brought before the Triumvirate after his failure, and he begs for his life saying it was all his fault. The Triumvirate asks the person behind him what she recommends, and Rose's mother steps forward and says, execution. So in an interesting plot twist, Lavender turns out to be one of the bad guys, or at least that's the idea. This is why I bring up Invincible because it does the same thing and it's way more impactful. I was actually puzzled for a bit as to why this works here and not here, because it's like, it's the same core twist, and then I realized it was in the details. I see Invincible, and I'm pretty sure it's not mind control and he genuinely is the bad guy, but I see this, and I'm pretty sure she's just a double agent. See. What Invincible does is that it hard commits and does like irreparable damage. The plot twist villain brutally murders seven well-established characters who have done nothing to indicate they have anything less than good intentions. Meanwhile, there are a bunch of little weird scenes from Omni-Man that make him feel ominous that are recontextualized with this reveal. But the big thing is the commitment to consequence. It's important that these deaths are very brutal because it helps prove it's not fake out and the story really did just kill these characters. The story takes you by the balls and proves to you it's not fucking around. And once it proves to you it's not fucking around, you might actually believe they did something as crazy as make the main character's superhero dad the villain. For High Guardian Spice to hit us hard, Lavender needs to do more than ask for the execution of the villain. At the very least, we need to see this follow through. But we really need to show her do something irredeemable, and it needs to be by herself so it doesn't look like she's trying to pretend to be someone she's not. It would also be good if it was not on one of the antagonists, because that's that, she, then she's just killing the bad guy, that's not that big a deal. But there we go. We finally made it through all 12 episodes of High Guardian Spice. 
Ultimately, I think it's mediocre. There's some stuff that I feel nothing for, there's some good stuff too, and there's also some bad stuff that brings that good stuff down. I don't think it's mean bad, I just think it's mediocre. I could just end on that, but uh, I've got a better idea. So. On January 19th of this year, Ray Rodriguez, the creator of this show, made a big tweet thread on Twitter. It reads as follows. High Guardian Spice had a very small budget. We were the first show of a non-union studio. If you're mad at the animation quality, it was the budget. BG art? Budget. Writing? Budget. We literally started storyboarding the first episode before the script was even finished. So when we inevitably ran into problems, or productions do, we didn't have the time or money to slow down and fix them, we had to barrel forward and make do with what we had. People compare High Guardian Spice to anime because it's on Crunchyroll, but it isn't anime, it's a cartoon made with the same pipeline as any other American cartoon. Our budget was comparable to that of a CN show, which are usually 11 minutes long, are comedy centred and have much simpler backgrounds and characters. Really the best show to compare High Guardian Spice to is Onyx Equinox, our sister show, and the only other show made at the same studio as High Guardian Spice. OE had the advantage of learning from the mistakes made on High Guardian Spice and being Union, but it was a lot of the same team and the same pipeline. What we were trying to make was incredibly ambitious for what we were working with, and we did the best we could. Maybe in another timeline, High Guardian Spice would have gotten the budget and schedule it needed to reach its full potential. And also, in another timeline, maybe High Guardian Spice wouldn't have been roped into a culture wars from its first trailer and marked as bad years before it came out. But alas, this is the timeline we're all in, and all I can do is shout about it on Twitter. Instead of piling on High Guardian Spice's trash campaign, maybe think about what happened behind the scenes to make it that way, have empathy for the real human beings who did their best working on it, and think critically about who started this hate campaign in the first place. Okay, so first off this rings a little hollow to me. The I'm in the industry, you didn't know what it was like has always felt like a very frustrating argument to me, because no one can verify that claim, there's just you. So if you're going to use this argument, why not give us evidence? You're telling me in all your time there, and all your resources and documents, you can't show us anything to demonstrate this? We just have to go on your word? It feels like Miles from Crunchyroll all over again, where he's like, I'm in the industry, you don't know what you're talking about, there are a million sources that contradict you, but when you're actually like, okay, please give me the evidence so I can look over it, he refuses, because it turns out it didn't exist. It's a bold-faced lie to scare you into not pushing you so you don't feel like you're about to sacrifice your world for you. So I can't speak for the animation. But what I can speak for is the writing. This tweet gives you the impression that you had zero time to plan out the story, or characters, or world building, but You've done interviews where you've admitted that High Guardian Spice has been worked on since 2013. To quote, I created High Guardian Spice in 2013. It started as a five minute storyboard pitch for Federator while I was interning there. It didn't get picked up, but it gave me the first real experience of pitching, and I'm forever grateful for that. The show has grown a lot since then, but the core characters and relationships are the same. Since that first pitch, I used Rosemary in my college thesis film Treasure Hunt and then continued to develop High Guardian Spice and pitched it every opportunity I got. Eventually I pitched it to Crunchyroll in 2016 and they liked it a lot, though they didn't have the bandwidth at the time to make it as a show. We started developing it as a comic in 2017, then I repitched it to them as a show when Marge Dean started at the company in 2018 and it quickly changed from a comic to a TV show. It was a very unusual process. Look, I get it. Being the centre of this must be incredibly hard, your body is on fire, you can't stop thinking about it, you can't escape it, and because there are so many people out there who hate your guts, it genuinely feels like your physical safety is in danger. I've made videos where I've had high dislike outs, and I've felt this, so God only knows this is hard for you. But, and I say this in the nicest way possible, it's okay to just suck. Like, like I did this too, I made my own lackluster project, and as easy as it would have been to blame it on time, or budget, it was me. I was preparing my own writing for a whole year and I still fucked up. I got blindsided by an element of storytelling that I didn't even comprehend until after. And it's not just the writing, it was me that picked the artist, it was me who organised and managed them, it was me who had no idea that, at the time that a comic should be written to take advantage of its visual component, and it was me who wasted a ton of my own money in the production because I had no idea how to do it efficiently. It was me. But you know what? Storytelling is hard. Managing a project is hard, but coming out of all of it and taking failure like this, it's a waste. It may seem like all these eyes on your passion project is a curse, but for someone who truly desires to make a beloved story, you are sitting on a gold mine. You have a level of audience testing data other writers could only dream of, and literally hundreds of thousands of people know the name High Guardian Spice and are eagerly awaiting to see what's next. 
they're doing it to rip you apart, mind you. But the flip side is, if you do like a comic or something else following on from season one and fucking nail it, you are perfectly set up for a redemption arc in the eyes of the consumer. I mean, I know what I do in your situation, but hey, the choice is yours. And for what it's worth, I genuinely do hope you make the choice that makes you the happiest. I'll see you later.